Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 106 of Through the Years, the podcast that reviews Ring of Honor show by show from the beginning. My name is Trevor Dame. I'm one half of the show. You'll, the other voice you'll hear, Matt Boyerstein, the other half of the show. And Matt, this is a momentous occasion for a few reasons. Like, first off, we are recording this the day that Ring of Honor is uh, doing their first TV tapings of the Tony Khan era. Although, I guess I should say, should we call them TV tapings? Because they're not going to be on TV, at least at this moment. I don't know. But the other thing I was thinking about, for some reason, Matt, uh, I was checking the other day, and I was like, uh, just one of those random things. I went to like a, a, one of the wikis and was like, you know, how many Ring of Honor shows would there be through 2000? Because we've talked about, I think we briefly mentioned a couple times on the show before that, like, obviously this show will run until one of us gets tired of doing it. But we've had a few end goals in mind of through 2007, through when Gabe leaves in late 2008, or maybe all the way through 2008. I know you had an idea for a show you'd want to cover one episode right after that. That'd be like leaving ahead of time. I have an idea for one other episode. But I was thinking, I was always thinking like, all right, what would be like the half Waypoint, And for some reason, just randomly, I checked today, according to uh, the wiki I looked at, if we went through 2008, there would be 212 uh, Ring of Honor events. So if we go on the longest possible timeline, Matt, which is a frightening thought, we have reached with this episode the halfway point. Wow. That's a a bombshell you dropped on me. I, um, I, I don't know how to feel about that. I feel like that's an accomplishment, though. Like we, we, we yeah. have halfway to our what I think feels like a somewhat realistic goal, um, assuming that, you know, our lives never improve or get more interesting or <laughs> never get anything better to do with our, which I feel like, you know, seems like also a realistic, um, expectation. So I feel like, yeah. So we've been doing this now for coming up on six years, uh, in a few yeah. weeks. And so if we do six more, uh, yeah, I will. Not even be, I will be about 45. And, and yeah, I feel like, yeah, I don't mind my 40s. I don't plan on doing anything good in my 40s. So that's perfect. Yeah. I had this really mixed, weird, mixed, weird feeling. Like I like the show. I'm proud of it. I mean, we still get, you know, I'm sure I don't know what our listeners are at this point, but we, you know, it seems like every episode we get, you know, we just got, I, I showed you a few days ago, we got a lovely message board post by someone saying, like, I just discovered the show. I'm working through it and listening to, uh, one to three episodes a week. And I thought, man, if you're listening to nine hours of us a week, like, I, my relatives would not wish that on listening to me for nine hours a week. But, um, I mean, I listen, say- I mean, I know you're trying to be self deprecating, but I don't think anyone's relatives want to listen for them for nine hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I had this really mixed of feelings where it's like, I really like the show. I have fun doing it, but yet still the, and I, you know, I intend on keep doing it till it's not fun until whatever. But like the idea also thinking like, if we keep doing it, I, the same math you just did, like, Oh, this would put me probably into my mid forties. I was like this cold chill on my back. I was like, Oh God. But See, at the same and time, for me, like, for me, I what do I give a shit? I don't, I don't get a cold chill. It's my forties. Whatever. What the fuck am I going to do in my forties? Who gives a shit? <laughs> See, I, I I am terrified, but uh, the idea of spending this – you, you know what's the scarier – we should get to the show, so, but you know what's the scarier thought, Matt, would be the thought that this becomes – you know, if we do this for over a decade, the idea that one day we won't do it, like, will there become a day where it'll be like, man, there's something missing in my life because I don't talk with Matt about old Ring of Honor every two to three weeks. Like, like what if it becomes that – like, I don't know how I would feel when this show ends because it, it is yeah. – uh, strangely enough, like, it is – like, there's not many things in my life – like hobbies that I have stuck with this long. Well, it's, so, it's, it's grounding in a way to have like, that's, that's sort of like, okay, this is, well, I know that like, I have this that I have to do and want to do. And yeah. like, so, yeah. So, I mean, who knows? Yeah. Maybe we'll want to keep going. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like at a certain point, if I was going to keep doing a podcast after the part of ROH, like the era that I'm like maximally interested in, I feel like I probably wouldn't want to do that. You know, like, yeah, I'd try to think of something else. Like, I, you know, obviously, I don't think like there's ever a reason to like be like, I'm going to retire from podcasting. Because <laughs> first of all, people be like, who are you? And then second thing would be like, um, what else? What what else am I going to do? The other thing I wanted to mention is that you mentioned last night you were looking on some of the wikis, and it just when you said that it made me feel like this is like the name of some like popular vacation destination. Like, oh, we're going to the Berkshires <laughs> for the for the weekend. We go we're going to spend a, we're going to spend a long weekend in the wikis. 
always choosing do we go to the Seychelles or do we go to the Wikis? But oh, uh, the Poconos, the Wikis, the Florida Keys, <laughs> the Florida Wikis. <laughs> but uh, the Florida Wikis. I love that Wiki line pie. But uh, okay, with that kind of joke, I, I should probably move on to the show. So as always, on through the years, we cover the news that between the last show we covered in the timeline and the current show. Just a couple things here. Um, the first thing, it's something we've touched on before, but I, I like just like pinning it down to a specific time. Dave Meltzer wrote in The Observer in this time frame. He wrote, while negotiations aren't dead in this regard, as things stood as of the weekend, it looked unlikely that Kenta Kobashi would be brought into Ring of Honor this year. Gabe Sapolsky was trying to put, get to put together a Kobashi versus Joe 2 match. So it's interesting to think that like to this deep in the year, like until we get to this point, there was still like a hope, you know. And you consider, like, if they're going to do it probably around the same time they did last year, because they – didn't they do it that year in October? They like to do it kind of, like, in time to get the DVDs out for Christmas sales, you know, gift-giving. You know, the time was running out, so – Yeah, I forgot that was even still in the cards by mid-year. Yeah. You know, re- so that, they probably got to the point where it's like, look, we need to book them, you know, if we're going to do this. And they probably eventually just said, like, no, it's not going to – and, of course, eventually – I don't think it would be that long after that – I do not think where uh, Kobashi had the cancer, so which would rule out everything. So um, then the other story was uh, Matt as a, as a hard and fast rule, the Feuerstein, the Feuerstein rule, or not really a rule. I I agree with this rule, but we do not, will not, won't not cover FIP. But <laughs> there's and we, that will come into play later on the show. Yes. But also there is something we have to talk. It, it's a weird thing that happened with FIP at this time part. We'll go to the Observer again. FIP ran a co-branded – I forgot they did this – FIP slash Ring of Honor show. Even though it felt feels like – look at. I'll read out this card. It's like the same mix of Ring of Honor guys and half Florida guys that FIP generally ran. But I guess they called it a co-branded show because um, both Ring of Honor, the tag, and the world title were defended on the show. So uh, Dave Meltzer writes in the Observer. They had two Ring of Honor title matches on the June 10th FIP show in Orlando before 200 fans. Brian Danielson kept the singles title over Colt Cabana in 22 minutes, but Colt got his foot on the ropes before the three count. The main event saw Aries and Strong beat Jarrell Clark and Jay Fury in what was said to be a great match. Now, for those of you that don't know what FIP uh, drew, you might think 200 fans only. I'll, I'll go jump to the Ring of Honor Newswire, which covered the show as thusly. Um, this is remember Ring of Honor Newswire on the Ring of Honor's official website. They wrote Impact of Honor, which was the name of the event. So FIP triple its normal crowd in Orlando. <laughs> and people think, well, these things might contradict you. I don't think they do, Matt. I think both those things can be true. That FIP drew 200 people, and that was a tripling of their normal crowd. Yeah, so, no, it's true. I mean, if you watch some of those like 2005 FIP DVDs, like yeah, there's like those crowds are sparse, man. So like yeah, 200. That sounds like a lot. And like, think about it, on the indies, 200 can be a lot. Yeah. It is crazy, though. I mean, to this day, to think that so many of the shows, I'm sure not many people even watch them on DVD. I don't think the FIP DVDs in general were very big sellers. And so many few people didn't uh, attend it. But yet you saw like, if you just watched the few these few years of FIP, you saw just like in Ring of Honor, you saw a who's who. Like, just look at this card. Okay, this was FIP slash ROH Impact of Honor is what they called the event. No impact was on the show, so uh, false advertising was not a triple brand show. But Sal Renaro defeated Canadian Cougar in the opener in 1231. That was uh, Tony Kazina, who often, you know, a trainer of Davey Richards, he would show up often where Davey was. Um, Alex Porto defeated Seth DeLay in 544. We'll see Seth DeLay very soon on Through the Years, actually. A four-way fray match, uh, Chase and Rance, who, uh, not great guy, uh, defeats Kenny King, Rainman, and Ryan Drago, the future uh, Simon Gotch in 802. Shingo Tagagi defeated Davey Richards in 1236. You could have 200 people in 2006 got to see Shingo take on Davey Richards. Uh, Steve Madison defeated Eric Stevens in 1241. The Heartbreak Express defeated Masked Fipper number 13 and the Super FIP Machine. Then uh, Brian Danielson beat Cole Cabana. I'm so jealous. (laughs) Brian Danielson. I mean, I don't know who they are. They could be really great people. I I don't know, but it's fun. They're funny names. That's all I'm reacting to. (laughs) Uh, Brian Danielson beat Cole Cabana for the ROH World Title, 22 minutes, 15 seconds. And then in the tag team title match, Aries and Strong defeated the team of Fast and Furious, Jay Fury and Jarrell Clark, in 2140. The one thing I felt bad about this is. 
I feel like Matt, the few performances we've seen of guy of Jay Fury and Jarrell Clark and their individual performances in Ring of Honor, they haven't gotten much of a shot. But we were like, yeah, these guys, we want to see more of them. They look pretty good. And I feel like this is the kind of match they should have gotten in Ring of Honor because Dave says from the live report it was a great match. Like I bet you these guys could have torn the house down if they got the same match in Ring of Honor. I mean, I've never seen this match, but like if you just put them against Aries and Strong and say you got twenty minutes, go nuts. Like to me, that's giving these guys a real chance. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if, as opposed to the way they, these guys generally get booked, which is you know five minute matches, parts of six way scrambles. And you know, and it, this was part, it would have made sense given that Aries and Strong were like we're going to do open challenges and stuff. And yeah, so I mean, I think that if they, if they had a great match, why not give them the chance to have a great match on a main ROH card? I guess maybe just the timing didn't work out. Yeah. I don't know. Or just being afraid that you constantly need like a big name team to draw. But you could have found a card where like there were some other big matches so that the tag team – they've done that with the world title sometimes, you know, where like they'll give Danielson like a lesser opponent because there's other stuff on the show. Yeah, that I mean these, kind of on these like ROH load. shows, yeah, you just you, – you make other matches yeah. the marquee match. Not every match has to be the draw. And like you said, like this would have been a perfect excuse with the idea of Aries and Strong starting this. We're going to like travel around defend. You could say, and the open challenge. We could have said, like, okay, the best tag team for FIP is coming. You know, and for sure. I mean, they literally randomly put together Tony Mama Luke and Sal Renaro and gave them the tag <laughs> yeah. team titles. Do you do you really buy the idea that they were worried that they need marquee names for a tag yeah, title be- match? To be fair, that was when they were taking on Whitmer and uh, Jacobs, and I don't think that team was ever like considered to be the team that was carrying the load for drawing. Where Aries and Strong are getting a lot of main events, so at this point, so. But yeah, no, I, I see your point. Um, and that brings us to the show we're covering today, which really kind of a fascinating show for a lot of reasons. I will say this is a show where things went wrong in a lot of ways, but maybe. It still turned out to be entertaining. We'll we'll get to it. Um, in your face. And I gotta say, like, even though like this is kind of a goofy name, I have to say this might be one of the most appropriate names I've ever heard for an ROH <laughs> show for a lot of different reasons. Like, I'm not even trying to be funny. Like, I think this yeah. is this is like a really in your face kind of show. Night of injuries or in your face were the two options, but uh, it took place June seventeenth, two thousand six, at the New Yorker Hotel in New York City, New York, in front of a reported crowd of eight hundred fans. Uh, Melter would write in the Observer that the June seventeenth Ring of Honor show that was formerly at the Chelsea Pier in Manhattan was moved back to the New Yorker Hotel because the pier was unavailable due to a charity function. So yeah, originally Ring of Honor was supposed to already be done with the New Yorker because we've talked about other through the years episodes where we've seen shows in the New Yorker, great atmosphere. But basically, right from the jump, it was too small for Ring of Honor. In fact, uh, Dave would write, the Danielson versus Kenta versus Joe match, which is the main event of the show, drew a sellout of 800 fans for the last Ring of Honor show to be held at the New Yorker Hotel on June 17th. The building should only hold 700 people, and people were packed in so tight that virtually everyone who sent in a report noted how crammed and uncomfortable it was. So wait, let's back back up there. That's important. I have a few things to say about what you just said. but Yeah, go ahead. Joe versus Kobashi. How many people did they say was at Joe versus Kobashi? They said more than uh, 700, right? Yeah, give me a minute. I can look it up, but uh, just give me – you You keep going. Though they said more than 700, and yeah. clearly they said this was – the building could only hold 700. Now it was holding 800, so it was packed in tight. I can confirm that it was extremely packed in. You could even see that on some of the sides, the aisleways were way more narrow than they were on the other uh, shows at that building. So – there's something off about those that Joe versus Kobashi. Clearly, they only had like 700 in that building, which makes it even crazier um, um, that so few people saw that match live. But the other thing I wanted to say is I was so happy when they moved that show from Basketball City because, as we've talked about, Basketball City was not the best place to see an ROH show. And so when I, I actually – you know, I usually buy general admission tickets at this point to ROH shows because, you know, I'm a man of the people. Um, but um, but at Basketball City, I learned that I had to buy like second or third row or else I was going to have a terrible experience. So I bought third row tickets to that show. Then they moved it from Basketball City back to the New Yorker Hotel. So I had like really good seats at the New Yorker Hotel, which I wouldn't have otherwise sprang for. So that made the show a little bit more entertaining for me in that level and a little bit more visceral also. 
and – and I've said this before. It's a shame that the New Yorker just wasn't bigger because it is a really cool-looking building. There's a great glass chandelier, which will come into play later. You got the upper tier. Like it just looks like – it's a cool-looking building. The atmosphere was always good in those shows. But The atmosphere was unparalleled in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And also I just looked it up. So the Observer claimed that Joe versus Kobashi drew 750 fans. So according to the Observer, 50 more fans are in your face, which – in a, if you if the building can only – I assume when Dave says can only hold 700, that he means probably like it's only – built like it's probably only legal to hold 700 people right. in there. But, you know, probably but for like a I, fire know, code thing. I mean you definitely could see that the aisle was narrower, at least on one side um, on this show than it was Joe versus Kobashi. For whatever reason, they did they did at least move in the, the – like they did move up the chairs and make an, a, narrower, a narrower aisle on one of the four sides. So – they did have more people, at least in the in the, on that side of the building. I don't know. So uh, yeah, Dave talked about how everyone was sending a report, claimed it was cramped and uncomfortable, and then he continues. The company announced at the show that they would be moving to the Manhattan Center, the uh, 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 the one thousand one hundred seat original home of Raw, and run many times per year. So yeah, they're going to be moving to a somewhat bigger building. I mean. We're going from 700 to 1100, but um, it feels more yeah. bigger than that. <laughs> you know, like I, I was in both venues. Like it feels more than it. It feels like it holds more than just I don't know 400 more people. But I guess 400 yeah. is a lot, so maybe not. I mean, but they had like a full, any- they had a full size balcony at the at the Manhattan Center, like with like several rows. It wasn't obviously wasn't as big as the Hammerstein, but like I don't know. I mean, I guess I trust those numbers. I don't think that. Like ROH would lowball it, so I guess it's true. And it does kind of jive with you saying it did feel like this show had even more people crammed in. It did. Dave's estimate does go up an extra fifty people, so it's not. Right. They did say like uh, technically more people saw this show live than Joe versus Koban. Fair, yeah, um, fair, fair. But uh, the other thing of note, we'll get to it obviously. Uh, Kent is in the main event, but Kenta actually because he was working the next weekend for Ring of Honor, he just stayed in the U.S. Kenta actually. Uh, was going to be a guest trainer for Ring of Honor's wrestling school for this week. Uh, the pro wrestling torch wrote, Noah wrestler Kenta will return to Ring of Honor for a week in June. During that time, he will assist head trainer Brian Daniels in training the students at the Ring of Honor wrestling school. And then the torch added uh, Ring of Honor world champion Brian Danielson and Kenta will hold a special training seminar at the Ring of Honor wrestling school on June 18th. For more information, write ROH help at AOL.com. So that sounds like just anyone could have like, maybe like gotten attendance of that like would have been interesting if there's anyone that just decided hey i'm i want to see if i can get learn to get my ass kicked by kenta for a day but that was one of the selling points of ring of honor's wrestling school at this time is they would say stuff like you know you never like game on those ads you know he would always be like you never know who's gonna show up at the ring of honor wrestling school i think they said something like like you know during this time period like raven showed up and kenta showed up so like you never know if you go to the school you might get to a random big star might come in Tell you yeah, I mean, but- it, it's not that random. Like, it's not like, I don't know, Kelsey Grammer is just going to walk in. <laughs> Although, you know, if it was just a few years later after he made money playing with Edge, you know, he might have made an appearance at a wrestling <laughs> school. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're going off the road. You should. We were fra- uh, things we can't talk about, but this has been a frazzled episode, but we're going to get into the groove right now because yes. we're going to get into the show. I make no promises. Well, we- <laughs> <laughs> we open with the Briscoes backstage, and despite just losing to the tag team champions two shows in a row, Jay Briscoe says it's only a matter of time before the belts come back to them. They implore each other to man up, so the manning up is starting, Matt. Yeah, I mean, um, this is actually a very significant pro, uh, promo, even though it only lasted like 30 seconds, because they debuted that catchphrase. This is the debut yeah. of the Briscoes' legendary It's Time to Man Up catchphrase. I think that that's worth celebrating. And it's interesting because, you know, man up, you sometimes, if you just said that, I think to a pe- person that doesn't follow wrestling or the Briscoes, you think, oh, you're, you're like saying, hey, you wimp, you better man up. But the Briscoes usually used in the context of each other. Like, oh, we didn't do good recently. We got to man up. You know, we got to face each other to tune up. We got to man up. You know, that it was more of a kind of like, it's almost like a reminder of the revelation with uh, Jay Briscoe's untimely passing that reach for the sky came for him crying when he watched Toy Story. Like the Briscoe's secretly heartwarming with all of their catchphrases. Um, yeah. But this, this what was fun about these early man up promos is that like when they would do it, they would also just like hit each other. They'd just be like <laughs> smacking each other, be like, man up, man up. 
I, I, there's no one in my life, Matt, where if they had told me to man up, I'd be like, I'm sorry. I've been trying the best I can. I would not respond with like a good natured shove back and another man up from myself. I'd be like, oh, God. Oh not God. even me? <laughs> if you question my manliness, Matt, I'd be like, oh, Matt, you're so right. I'm, you finally see through the facade. But um, oh, man. We, we, we then find tag team champs Austin Aries and Roderick Strong elsewhere backstage. Aries says there seems to be some confusion about what he said at the end of the last show about Generation Next. He reiterates that the name Generation Next doesn't apply to them anymore because they took the top spots like their goal was at the formation of the stable, so they just don't need to call themselves Generation Next anymore. Aries adds that tonight starts he and Roddy's world tour as they're going to defend the tag titles all over the world, just like Aries defended the Ring of Honor world title all over the world when he was champ of that. We're going to defend Aries them in the wikis. Like a- see, I, I, pro- I, see I, I didn't promise that it was going to get it back on the rails. <laughs> Aries ends by telling Roddy he has a nice bandana, as well as asking Roddy if he likes uh, his sunglasses, and Roddy thinks they're nice sunglasses. So uh, <laughs> that was – and that by the way, that will come full circle on this show too, which is uh, an interesting little weird thing. Um, the Briscoes, our opener, Jay and Mark. Defeated Jason Blade and Sterling Keenan, the future uh, Corey Graves, in 8 minutes 30 seconds when Mark Briscoe pinned Keenan after a spike J driller. Uh, Matt, uh, this was kind of a squash for the Briscoes, but 8 minutes, so that's a little longer than squash territory. But this was mostly, look how cool the Briscoes are, right? Yeah, I mean, this. Yeah, it wasn't a squash in the modern sense, but like it was like an old school TV squash in that they sometimes could last a while. And I think Blade and Keenan are a just random enough team to really be a tribute to some of those old school 80s TV squashes where you just put a couple of random guys together that makes in a way that makes no sense. Um, so, like, but it, you know, I like that they put the Briscoes in this spot because the Briscoes just lost two tag title matches in a row. So it makes sense that they would have to go all the way back down to the opener, wrestle a couple of randos, and work their way back up to a title shot. It makes total sense. Um, and the crowd was ready for them. Like, they were so excited. And also, like, the Briscoes, they wore these black shorts. I thought they looked really good. Obviously, red was their main color over those that did in that era. But I thought the black shorts, um, it, it suited them pretty well. Um, so a couple things early. First of all, this is when on the DVD they announced that they're moving to the Manhattan Center. And, you know, they mentioned, like you said, it was the original site of Monday Night Raw, which was 1993, um, which I try, I did a little math. Like, so that was 13 years before this. 13 years ago from now was 2010. So, like, it's just one of those weird things. Like, obviously, 1993, WWF seems like a million years away from 2006 ROH. Whereas I think like 2010 WWE doesn't doesn't really feel all that different from current WWE. Like it's different, but it's not that different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things where like time feels like it moves differently now than it did. I know I'm sure our listeners can relate to some of the stuff I'm saying, but I think it gets <laughs> it gets more pronounced when you get to be like close to 40. Um, and I'm sure it'll Do be even more Green pronounced. Lantern- Sorry, go oh, ahead. I was just, just going to ask, do you think Green Lantern fan was pumped? Because is, isn't that where he proposed to his wife famously on an early episode of Monday Night Raw? So I was yeah, like, hey, I, I, mean, get to, I, guess, I get to go back to where I proposed to my wife. I guess it depends on the, the status of their marriage, <laughs> 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 how he feels about it, which I am not privy to, so I don't know. But yes, assuming that – well, I'm not even going to say, but if things are good, <laughs> then yeah. I will say that uh, yes, he would probably be pretty excited. That would be a special place for him. Um, I have a feeling he'd be open to. He'd be okay with us talking about because when I just Google this just now, one of the thir- first things I get is a po- an episode of the Brian and Vinny show from last year where they had Paul on to talk about proposing to his wife on that episode of Raw. Oh, so good. yeah, so yes, he'd probably is, be okay. So hallowed ground for uh, Mr. Yeah. Green Lantern fan tonight. Maybe not the best night for Green Lantern fan. I'll get to it later. Um, but, um, yeah, so as far as the match, um, you know, they, 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 I mean, Mark and Jay, like, really do look like the Road Warriors compared to Keenan and Blade. So I feel like it's fitting that they do the Doomsday device. They're very aggressive early. They immediately go into some big spots. Um, Blade hits a big dive onto Jay. Then Keenan gets on the apron. And Mark does that really cool, like, leaping head scissors from inside the ring over the top rope onto Keenan, who's on the apron, flipping him over onto Blade on the outside. I Was that the first time they did that spot? Cause that I'm spot, not sure. That spot got over, like, so yeah. huge. I feel like it was, like, one of the most over spots of the entire show. Um, 
They, um, you know, they go back in the ring. They, it slows down a bit. Mark does this cool slingshot into the ring after a tag and like immediately like slingshots into a monkey flip onto Blade, like on the way in, which I thought was very cool. Um, they, they, the Briscoes, they do a lot of frequent tags. So they're not just showing off their offense. They're also showing off their tag team prowess. Um, you know, hard shoulder tackles, various suplexes. There's one point where Blade actually tries to go toe to toe with Jay with a forearm exchange and actually gets a two count off a of forearm, which I don't think I would have expected. Um, so they work on Blade for a while, then Blade just kind of tags Keenan kind of randomly. Things slow right back down when when Keenan gets on offense. Um, but yeah, he, he does some spots. He hits a backstabber with a with, while Jay is hung up in the middle rope. He does, you know, that very classic indie spot where he tells the crowd to be quiet, like he's going to hit a hard kick to Jay, but instead he just grabs a chin lock. <laughs> I feel like that that really mostly works on the indies. Like you don't really see yeah. that being done in a big arena very often, where like you you do the the chin lock as the heel spot after you build up a bigger move. Um, but uh, seen a, a number of times in ROH in the time that we've done this uh, we've done this show. Um, and that that would have been tailor made for Randy Orton. Like he should have just leaned into it. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm gonna punt this guy and then chin lock. Yeah, well, I feel like that would have worked. He could, you know, what? it's not too late for Randy. He could, he could do it when he comes back. Um, but um, and eventually, um, a Blade comes in. Mark dumps him on his head with a suplex. Mark and Jay do the splash mountain neckbreaker combo on Keenan. Blade breaks that up, and then. Mark and Jay chuck Blade like really high into the air and Jay does a military press into a Death Valley driver on him. They hit the springboard spike Jay driller on Keenan, get the win. Um, so yeah, Keenan and Blade, they got more offense than I remembered, but obviously this was a showcase for the Briscoes' killer offense. Um, this was put on ROH videos and I think it was by far the most buzzed about match on that site in that entire first like six to eight months of that site. Um, got people got got people really excited about the Briscoe. So this was like one of the most successful ROH videos matches there was because between the hot crowd and the Briscoe's cool offense, I feel like it was just a, it was just a really nice way to open the show. Nothing, you know, they didn't try to have this amazing match. They just showcased a really cool team doing really cool stuff. I um. I'm really glad you mentioned that this was a free match on the Ring of Honor website because I remember – I forget – I probably had – sometimes I had to take a little pause. I was buying all the Ring of Honor DVDs in order, but sometimes you know, being a poor guy coming out of his teens, I had to uh, take a little pause and sometimes to wait for shows. And I remember this this match was my first chance of seeing the Briscoes again since they left Ring of Honor. And you know, just when you haven't seen them – like. Their bodies are completely different. Their gear is different. You know, we've talked about this before. They went from being teenagers on that first run to now they're just grown ass men and seeing just, you know, their offense being a bit different. Like, and I think that was the thing for me and a lot of other people talk about how this was like the most buzzed about all, all these little online squashes where you was in the habit of doing it this time. I think probably it, part of that was because a lot of us, this was our first exposure to, I guess what I'll call like the man up era of the Briscoes. You know, if we consider the errors of the Briscoes being like, teen phenom prodigy briscoes we we've been through that this kind of like the the man up era where their muscular offense changed a bit the gears changed a bit and then i guess the last era would be the the them boys era i'll call it where you know the personalities really bloomed completely grew out the hair went nuts in a great way um yeah this was this was like a like holy shit these guys have grown up it, it was a so i always have like a fond feelings for this match because of that and then, yeah, you covered it. it, it it's a, it's a mostly just a, uh, you know, an extended kind of enhancement squash, whatever you want to call it, match where Keenan and Blade do get a little bit of offense. Um, Blade does one of my pet peeves, Matt. I know one of your pet peeves you've talked about on the show before is the guy who gets beat up a long time, tags out, and then his partner does like only a couple moves and tags him back in. My pet peeve on that level is what you see here where guy is the face in peril for a long time. He finally gets like control of the match, and then instead of tagging out, he like decides to do three moves. And that's just like I'm screaming my head, like tag out! You just got beat up for like three minutes straight, really badly. But I feel like Jason Blade's probably. If I was Jason Blade, I was probably. I'd probably be thinking like, I'm not gonna get a chance to do any offense in this match if I don't do something right now. So I, I better do a couple spots before I tag out. I, I could see a guy thinking that, but overall though, you know, fun. Uh, and yeah, this was a match where. 
I don't know if you noticed this, Matt, but I felt like they were bulkier here, even than in recent shows, I mean, just a little bit, but it was some, maybe it was just, maybe the black, the, the, those black trunks did something to accentuate it. Even the black is supposed to be swimming. Also who they were wrestling, you know, they, yeah. like Aries and strong are big beefy guys themselves, you know? But Prezek even goes to the point to say that the Briscoes look bigger than ever, and Mark even flashes after the match. So like they were really feeling them. They were they were proud of the work they were putting in that. They, their bodies were getting there, but uh, as they should have been. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we we should all be so lucky to have had the muscles of the Briscoes in 2006. But um, next we join Nigel McGuinness backstage, who calls himself the best champion in Ring of Honor. Tonight he's going to make history one more time, becoming the first double champion in ROH. And because he's beaten both of the men he's challenging tonight, Aries and Strong, in singles matches, he says that means he gets to pick his own partner. I didn't know if that's how it works. But um, in comes that partner, Colt Cabana. Colt compliments Nigel's spiky hair. The two shake hands. Colt says the last time they were tag team, it didn't go so well. They parted ways. They had a soccer ride. He just offhandedly says that. But this time will be different. Nigel says rock and roll. Colt says, isn't punk rock the English thing, though? And he shouts out Billy Idol. So it is interesting that they kind of acknowledge the past, but it's also interesting that, like, yeah, the entire genesis of these two – all the entire history of these two guys together in Ring of Honor is they tried being a tag team. It didn't work out to the point that they actually ended up having a feud against each other, and now Nigel's like, yeah, that guy's going to be my partner tonight, but – I have a couple hey. things to say about this promo. Um, first of all, do you think it was too goofy or do you think it's like whatever, it's fine? Um – I think it, the Colts have bordered on being a little too goofy, especially when Nigel was trying to transition to being more serious. And it felt like – I think we talked about this recently on another show where it was like um, that we're in this weird mill era for Nigel where it feels like generally he's being more serious. But occasionally in his matches and his promos, like the old Nigel that we've seen for the year or two previous will come out for like – He'll bring out the Bret Hart best there is thing randomly when he hasn't done that for three or four matches, you know, or, and this felt like, you know, Colt kind of bringing him back to mid card goofy Nigel for a second. Yeah. And the other thing, oh, Colt, we have two more things. First of all, we're getting very close to Nigel just like fully turning face, um, a couple months away, I guess. Um, and you know, so he's, he's acting a little bit more, um, magnanimous toward Colt here. He's not really being particularly heelish in any kind of way. I would say he's not really heelish during the match, which we'll get to, not particularly anyway. And so I have to say, I think it's fair to say at this point, having seen almost the entire Nigel McGuinness ROH first heel run, this version of Nigel is one of the least dastardly pushed heels I think I've ever seen. Like, if you think about it, like, you know, he's won a few matches by cheating here and there, like very minor stuff. He he did, you know, hit a he hit Claudio with the uh with the iron a couple times, bloodied him. But like in general, he did very little like really despicable stuff. He's really just mostly like smarmy and goofy and like arrogant. You know, like he's really yeah. a particularly not villainous heel. <laughs> And even his cheating is almost admirable because it's always so – it's usually so smart and he's like really smartly manipulating the rules. Like it's not usually just like a cheap cop out. Like you just beat yeah. Danielson but it was because at the last second he like pulled out a chair as Danielson was diving at him like just to defend himself. Like right. stuff like that. It's not like, oh, he's the most evil plot of all time. It's just like, oh, he's he's kind of clever out of desperation. Yeah, which is I guess you know kind of smart of him. I'm not saying – I'm not sure if this was a conscious thing but like – he was in a he was in a company where like guys were trying to be like really like over old school heels like rave you know really trying to get a lot of heat even punk when he turned heel like and so Nigel's just like yeah I'm not gonna go all in like that I'm just gonna be kind of like a, a scamp <laughs> which I think worked out pretty well for him the other thing I was gonna say is you said that Colt was like I thought punk rock was the British thing after Nigel said rock and roll um, mm. so all the history of British music and the like, obviously, punk's a big part of it, but, like, Colt doesn't realize that, like, also rock and roll, pretty big part of the British music history. Like, the Beatles. Little band called the Beatles. <laughs> the Rolling Stones. Led Zeppelin. <laughs> the Who. Like, these were not punk yeah. bands. Like, I, I feel like th- th- those bands are even more famous than the punk bands. Yeah. Anyone that wants to learn about the history of punk rock, if Colt would like to educate himself. Uh, Please Kill Me is an oral history of the punk, early days of punk by uh, Legs McNeil, I believe. That's a that's a good book there. Free book recommendation for everybody. But um, Matt, did you have anything else to say? I know you said you had a few points. Was that both of them? That was all of them, yep. Okay. Thank you. Now, next, 
No, <laughs> no, that was that was wonderful, Matt. Um, you should have the floor whenever you want, like a like a janitor with a lot of access. But um, so next <laughs> we have <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, next we have a. We have the first thing that went wrong on this show on a night of things that went weird or wrong. And uh, although and I'm not talking about this podcast, I'm talking about the show we're covering and it did not make the air. This is a this is a real rarity. And I, I did not know this happened or if I did, I had forgotten about it until I did the research of the show. Going back to the observer here. This is a match that did not make the DVD, but Dave writes about. He writes, the worst reaction to a Ring of Honor match all year was to the second match in which Jay Christ, which Dave, you got that wrong. It's Jay Christ of Airborne Express. Dave, that's Irish Airborne. Beat Marcos. <laughs> I, didn't even, I read that. I didn't even pick up on that Airborne Express. I like it. <laughs> Uh, people turned on it quickly and were chanting for it to end from the two minute mark it was a bad match as well ricky reyes beat dave chris coming out of that which we will talk to in a second but i want to point out something out to people which is like the ring of honor history there have been matches so bad that ring of honor has not put them on the dvds we and you know they're kind of infamous in fact they're you generally it's so rare that ring of honor did that that Ring of Honor, in fact, put out a DVD, I believe, called ROH Uncensored, which was a lot of pre-show matches. And But the selling point was just, here are the matches we've edited out that were, like, famous for being terrible. It was the uh, the ICP match. It was the Conan match. And it was the Teddy Hart. It was not the entire match. The match made to the, the original DVD. But it was the Teddy Hart moonsaults and vomits in the ring after the match, which – curve cage match scramble cage match kerfuffle that resulted in him getting basically blackballed out of ring of honor the crazy and the th- craziest example of that was they did it to a match between el generico and kevin steen from the homecoming in 2005 that's got to oh, be the, yeah. like the most absurd example of that i've ever you know i'm not saying the match like was was good but like that's just a crazy trivia note so those matches i just mentioned they never they, they made that roh uncensored dvd I don't believe this match is ever made to, and I have, after reading this thing, it's like one of the worst matches Ring of Honor had, you know, like that the fans turned on it almost immediately. I, keep, keep, keep in mind, you know, what makes this even more unique is they didn't just cut out one match. They cut out two, pretty much two matches. They just showed a, like a brief clip of the second one and they and had the other, time on this DVD to show those matches. Yeah, I was just going to mention, the, you know, most Ring of Honor DVDs, DVDs at this point were going right up against the three hours, or at this point we were just a few shows after Ring of Honor figured out a different burning method or, or whatever for DVDs where they could extend the DVD running length to like up to three hours and 15 or three hours, 20 something in that three, range. I think three and a half was there. Uh, yeah. Was there. And, and, and this is a show, this is the rare ring of honor show. It's one of the shorter shows we've covered recently. It's only two hours and like 43 minutes, I believe. And then it's so short. They put an entire FIP match on at the end of the show just to fill up the DVD. They easily could have put on. So that's how bad this match was. Like they were like, even though we have the time, we're kind of coming in under time on the show. We are still not going to put this match on. So, yeah, I don't. I, I don't remember the matches, but I definitely remember the the crowd being very mean to them, and I felt bad because I always feel bad in situations like that. Especially because Marcos, like that's a beloved kind of undercard like fan favorite. Yeah. For the fans to turn on them at two minutes in, I mean, wow. I but, guess I guess really done was the popular one among that crowd. <laughs> I'm just kidding, People but like, that, uh, yeah, this, this is really though. crazy. Um, so that brings us to the match that, like we just alluded to, it did kind of make the DVD. We'll, we'll explain in a second. Nah, Ricky Reyes not scored to the really. ring. <laughs> Ricky Reyes is scored to the ring by Julie Smokes defeated Dave Christ with Jake Christ via submission in 54 seconds with the Dragon Sleeper. That's the time Cage Match gave. I'm assuming they're just counting the time that we were shown. I don't know how long the actual match was. We're, we're, this is just started in progress. A voiceover from Gabe Sapolsky tells us this match was presented earlier tonight as a bonus for the Fly fans, which I think is code for this didn't turn out well. And they're showing us this highlight because of an incident that occurred after the match. So clearly this was only shown because there's an angle coming up right afterwards that they had to show. But otherwise, this I likely would have been, I think, removed too, right? I mean, there's no other reason to watch the show this, really. Yes. Yeah. And this it, was also... It, it, was, sh- it th- was shown to explain the, uh, the post-match angle. And this is also the example of the other, like, we're in this weird nether middle ground for uh, uh, Ricky Reyes' push where he's kind of 
you know, he's not the unbeatable Ricky Reyes anymore. You know, he's lost to Delirious. He just lost to Shingo. But he still sometimes will squash people. Like, he's like, a, he's it kind of like, to a baby face now, which is very different than being like muscle for a heel group. Yeah, it, it just feels like to me, it feels like looking at his booking right now, it's like they kind of don't know what to do with him at this point. It feels like kind of after the feud with Aries and him losing to Delirious, that was kind of like, okay, we've kind of – used his streak to kind of hopefully gain a little bit of interest and put somebody over. And now I guess we can have him keep squashing people. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. which is funny but, because he just pretty much had his best singles match the, the show before. One of them. Yeah, with Shingo. Yeah, yeah. with Shingo, yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, Reyes wins, but he refuses to release the dragon sleeper. Jake Chris gets in, tries to get in the ring, but Julius Smokes attacks Jake. Then Chris Hero, the CZW world champion at this point, or I guess just champion, jump. We'll talk about the distinction between a world title and a non-world title later, Matt. Uh, jumps in through the crowd to ringside. He lays out Smokes with his title belt before he immediately leaves back to the crowd. Homicide almost immediately is out to the ring. He grabs the mic. He calls Hero the F slur. Tells him to get back, Hero. Hero does not get back there. So Homicide says, here in Ring of Homicide, Hero's going to get fucked up. So that's going to – we will see him getting fucked up later. Um, but in terms of people getting fucked up in a different way, we got something right now. It's Davey Richards defeats Jimmy Rave, scored to the ring by Prince Nana, via submission in 9 minutes, 12 seconds, when he made Rave tap out to – I don't know what you call it. It's kind of like an arm cross face. He just kind of pins the guy's arm between his legs and kind of bends it. I think Danielson, this was basically what Danielson did to Roderick Strong the first time they wrestled in Ring of Honor. But um, so the story of this match is obviously in character. It's Davey Richards beat Rave in his immediate Ring of Honor debut, and Rave wants an immediate rematch. He gets it here. But the real story of this match was something not intended. We'll go to The Observer first. Dave wrote in The Observer. There was some trouble as when fans threw the toilet paper at Rave, a few rolls hit a chandelier. Dave writes, the people who hit it were aiming for it. Yeah, which I, then, I read that. How the fuck does Dave know that? I'm, exactly. Like, yeah. how can you tell? Just because like, somebody in the crowd, like, said, I think that they were aiming for it? Like, unless, I, the, I unless the person who did it told Dave that, there's no way he could know that. <laughs> that person should have been reported if he told him. But, yeah, I was going to ask you this. Wow, what, what a narc you are, Trevor. You're narking on the person that throws the toilet paper at the chandelier report this it was man. you wasn't it matt yeah, admit it now matt the, the, the statue of limitations no statue no no i was always afraid to throw toilet paper because i was afraid that my throw would be embarrassing see normally i would say anyone that was throwing like if, for people that aren't watching the show the chandelier is pretty high up so i would say you have to have been aiming to hit it but remember this is a building with a second a balcony floor and i think it very easily someone's throwing toilet paper from that floor could have hit it easily without intending. I, I, imagine. I, don't, I don't think that's what it was. I think that I, 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 cause I saw at least one of them hit like while watching and like it wasn't coming from the balcony. Uh, but that, that doesn't, I mean, you know, you could just throw with like a, an accidentally high arc. The chandelier was, the chandelier was high up, but it wasn't that high up that like if you just throw it too high of an angle that you couldn't have accidentally hit it. Well, on the other hand, I could also see why people would want to purposely throw toilet paper at the chandelier, not to break it and hurt the wrestlers or something, but to the old idea of like the same reason you would TP a tree. Like I could see someone – it would be really cool if it just hangs over the chandelier, man. Like, yeah, I yeah. Get, I could see it happening. I'm just saying I don't think that yeah. like Dave's reporting that like it's fact. Like I don't know how you could make that assertion. No, I agree. I, I had that same thought. Really. Like, how how does Dave know for sure what like the intention was of the person throwing the paper? Except, like you said, unless someone literally told Dave, "I I was the guy who did it. I'm so proud." I, I don't see how Dave would know that. Or, anyway. or I was the guy who did it. I thought it was funny and I feel bad. I guess that's all another possibility. Yeah, that, but Matt, still. there you are, always thinking better of people than I am. But still, but, um, but still, Dave definitely should have reported them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, Dave uh, – OK. So the next part of the line like, – this is my uh, criticism of Dave. Dave then wrote – you go, all right, so I'll just repeat. A few – people threw a few rolls at the toilet paper. A few rolls hit a chandelier, which then fell into the ring and broke. Now, part of – like pieces splintered off and fell into the ring. The, I think you just read that. That sounds like the entire chandelier. Most of the chandelier stayed up there. The, yes. The, the, you know, if, if, if the chandelier fell into the ring, we would have had a major issue. The, this is a big chandelier. But no, it's a glass chandelier, so lots of jingly glass pieces. Some pieces broke off and fell yes. into the ring. The whole thing did not fall, just to be clear. Yes, that is definitely um, true. The other thing is – and uh, one thing that I um, 
that you can't really appreciate watching on uh, on video that was apparent live was even if you were not looking at the chandelier, it made a pretty very a pretty loud noise when the when the toilet paper hit and you could be like oh shit that thing just broke <laughs> like you could yeah, like it, hear I mean, it even breaking. watching the DVD you can hear yeah you can hear a sound yeah. and you can hear the crowd go like a few people go like oh like yeah it's not an, uh, all yeah, the like, crowd, uh, like oh oh this is gonna be bad like that was yeah, I remember like, that feeling like oh they should do something <laughs> like someone should yeah, say something like. <laughs> people definitely immediately noticed um so dave continues both wrestlers were cut up wrestling in the ring with the broken glass more richards than rave richards eyes swell up big from taking a hard running knee from rave the athletic commission ordered the ring swept a few times during the show now if you're wondering like nine minutes for a rematch that seems kind of short well there's a reason for that too because the pro wrestling torch wrote both rave and richards reportedly suffered several cuts from the glass of the ring which was said to be cut sh- the match was said to be cut short due to fear that the new york athletic commission was going to stop the match so apparently yeah they went home early because uh and i think that's really fascinating because when you watch this match i feel like this match is one of the faster paced Jimmy Rave matches of this era where he's trying to be more of a throwback reserve heel. I think it's really fun. It's also one of the stiffer matches of that era. And I'm part of me is wondering how much of that was in the plan of just it's a rematch. We should do a bigger match. And how much of that was maybe them thinking, OK, we had like a 15 minute match. Oh, shit. We're worried this match could be stopped at any time. We better just go balls to the wall, do fun stuff quick. Because it, it definitely is like as mo- more of a sprint than you would expect from a Jimmy Rave match of this era. But I think it's really good. Like I would give it like a high good. Like it's a match where if it was a few minutes longer, I might be way higher on. But unfortunately, it's only nine minutes. But def- both guys, you see, they get their they get cuts on their back from the glass, which is painful. To- and, and it's one of those things that it's. I, I'm going to ask you, Matt. Like, why did they? not just stop them like it's apparent immediately there's glass in the ring and rave when the match starts he he um attacks uh, richards in like the aisle as he's making his entrance and they brawl outside i was thinking maybe that's even an audible to give them some time to sweep up the ring but if they do it's they don't do it long enough because they're not out there very long and when they get back in the ring there's only still clearly visible pieces of glass in the ring there's also like still a few scraps of toilet paper still in the ring like they have I, not um, if they had sw- i don't remember if they swept it while they were out on the floor and you just didn't see it but i feel like if they did you would have heard that sweep it up asshole chant during the match yeah. you didn't hear that till after so Although i don't think fair, i don't uh, think that happened after the match, Jimmy Rafe has a tantrum and at ringside, and one of the things he does is he grabs a broom at ringside and like tosses it down again, which makes me think that someone did try and briefly sweep it up. So yeah, maybe I, I'm, I, I, I'm just not, don't, I just I, don't remember. Um, yeah, but e- either way, um, I, I I enjoy the match is really quite a bit of fun if you can get over the also the wincing of like oh these guys are wrestling on little shards of broken glass and I think anyone that has ever dropped the glass on the floor and clean it up, but known you've never been able to find all the little shards. And then for the next couple of days, you're kind of, ow, crap, uh, there's a piece I haven't found. Like, I could just imagine taking bumps on that, like, especially when I could see a few visible little shards on the ring and seeing how both these guys do get cut up, how much that would have must have sucked. Um, but I thought it was an entertaining match, you know. I keep saying that, but I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. Uh, Rave catches uh, Richards with a really good looking, but almost too good looking. Like I almost thought this is where Richards got his eye hurt, but I don't think it was running like step up knee in the corner. And then later it's clear right near the end of the match. He catches uh, Richards with that running knee. He always does. I believe sometimes Rave called the Doppler effect where the guy is just sitting on the mat and he runs and he really fast at his opponent and hits him with the key being he hits the guy high in the chest with the knee where it's not going to do injuries. I guess this time it probably slipped, went up almost immediately. Richard's eye is swelling. We'll see it later in a pro. It's really badly swollen. And I, it, it's interesting. I, I'm not going to cast any asper- aspersions on Jimmy rave, but I do think it's interesting where listening to some of the shooter interviews raves done. He talked about in, in, up to this point, in the timeline, like two of the guys he had problems working on matches with. He complained about Davey Richards. We talked about on the last show and AJ Styles. And those are also the two guys he caught with his running knee and really like busted them up. And I, I, I think that's a complete coincidence. Rave has said that's a complete coincidence, but you know, maybe don't get an argument with Jimmy Rave about, you know, not knowing how to put together a match, but either way, good match. Kind of overwhelmed by the broken glass though. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the sort of glass-based death match that Jim Cornette would truly go on a tirade <laughs> about. Um, See what happens when he's not there to be commissioner on site. That's they, right. they go right back to the mud show days, man. That's right. It's, a, it's, a, it's some sort of outlaw show. That's why the commission would have stopped it. <laughs> um, but um, no, yeah, I agree with you. This was a real. I really liked how fast paced and hot it was. I mean. I don't know if like they they changed the pace of the match because of the glass because like they started that way immediately and if you you know been watching recent Jimmy Rave matches which we have like he does a lot of stalling <laughs> like I I think on the last match I said like between these I'm like this is like peak Jimmy Rave stalling this is like the least stalling uh Jimmy Rave match I can remember this one so like I feel like they were planning a hotter and heavier match and they did it you know they they do a lot of you know, big moves, do it fast. They they get cut up, like you said. I think, you know, Richards, whenever he does the uh, handspring kick during this era, because crowds haven't seen it yet, they go insane. Because it's just such a cool move. I still think it's awesome. Um, um, at one point, um, when, you know, when they're when Richards suplexes Rave over the top and they both fly over to the to the outside. I thought they did a great job of both tumbling to the floor. Because, you know, you see that spot in a lot of different ways, and sometimes it goes better than others. I think this was a really good version of that. Um, also, you know, Richard, you could tell he's just really on fire here. The crowd is so hot. Like, so when Richards hits the corner forearm lariat combo, and then yelling, fuck you, as he hits the lariat, he's just, you know, he's really amped up, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I think between the super hot crowd and the drama and the brutality with the glass, which is unfortunate, and the black eye on Richards and the fast paced sprint nature, this was so different from the first match and in a very fun way. So I thought it was memorable in several ways. I wish they hadn't actually gotten hurt. <laughs> yeah, and I think this match in some ways kind of sums up a lot of the show, which is it's memorable. Things kind of went wrong. Maybe it's not all memorable for the right reasons, but it's entertaining nonetheless. Like, you know, I'm sure they would prefer just having like a 15 minute match where glass didn't break and Davy Richards didn't get a giant black eye, but it sur- certainly makes the match very memorable and fascinating to watch. Um, so after the match, Rave and Nana throw a tantrum on the outside, which includes – this is the point where Rave chucks a broom. Um, as Richards walks up the ramp, we can hear the crowd in the background chanting, sweep it up, asshole, sweep it up, as Matt just alluded to earlier. So presumably r- before Richards can even get to the back, they're telling someone, get back in there, sweep, sweep this up. And as I think Dave, Dave wrote in The Observer, apparently someone was trying to sweep this up multiple times throughout the show, which – uh, hopefully, I, I I didn't see anyone else get cuts from glass the rest of the show. So presumably they figured it out after this match. But. They were in a hotel. You'd think that maybe they could like borrow a vacuum cleaner from somebody. <laughs> I would have loved this one just Kent with a vacuum cleaner. I would love to see a vacuum at a wrestling show. Um, next we go well, to Jimmy. They have weed whackers. They might as well have vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Next but we go the, to uh, then they have a washing machine done by the SAT. That's even more dangerous than the broken glass. <laughs> That's the most dangerous appliance in all of wrestling is the washing machine. That, that's a fan for people that watch 2003 Ring of Honor and listen to this show. Right. Um, next week uh, – by the way, I'll just mention it offhand. I forget. Someone – you know, you know, people gif Ring of Honor. They watch all Ring of Honor. Someone was like, the coolest move ever, the washing machine. And it was like – I think someone wrote something like, why don't they do that anymore? I was like, man, there, there's a good reason they don't do that anymore. It's, yes, uh, we, go, we go into it. And past yeah, it's episodes. nearly impossible to take and not get hurt. But uh, next we go to Jimmy Jacobs sitting on some stairs outside somewhere. I think this is probably not outside the building. This feels like something he maybe he shot in his home area. We can hear crickets even, which – so that's something. Yeah, he talks he, about, yeah they're really – it's very hard to hear crickets in Midtown Manhattan, I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, real, I realize how stupid I am now. Yeah, that, that, that gives it away. Um, he talks about how people asked him about his last match with uh, B.J. Whitmer where they both fell off the top rope and almost died. Jacob says he doesn't remember that match. He, he remembers locking up. And the next thing he remembers is sitting in the locker room after the match with peace, people asking him how many fingers they were holding up. I wonder if that's legit or not. Either way, uh, Jimmy says – then he got the DVD of the show. And then Jimmy literally holds up a physical copy of the DVD, which for some reason made me laugh. He says he's watched it and he saw BJ Whitmer almost kill him. He said that's a scary thought. But there's an even scarier thought and that is what would have happened to Lacey? Who would have taken care of her if he had died? Who would look after her? Who would protect her from all the creepy guys that are always hanging all over her? That was a great Jimmy line. Said, 
<laughs> Jimmy says, bringing any kind of anguish to Lacey is unforgivable. So in The New Yorker, a place where he and BJ tore the house down many times, which eh, <laughs> maybe once. One, one. One, 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 time. one stop. You did. Yeah. You you like the you like the Mama Lou. I like, match. I like that. I'm just saying many times. Yes. I don't even think they've been in the New Yorker many times. They had three so, matches uh, there. One of them, I think, unambiguously <laughs> tore the house down. Yeah, one was okay. He's go- we'll, we'll we'll call that a draw, Matt, between us. Um. Okay. So anyway, uh, Jimmy says he's going to tear BJ down. Lacey wanted him to take Whitmer out once, and it didn't happen. But this time, Jacobs guarantees he swears to God, he swears on Lacey and his future children, is Lacey and his future children, that Whitmer will not walk out of the building, and then he'll fight for the world title because the winner of this match is going to get a title shot against Brian Danielson. Jimmy says Brian Danielson has never faced anyone with the power of love in their corner, and then in the best moment of the promo, he then Jimmy Jacobs then says when he wins the Ring of Honor World title he's going to use the money from that to buy a starter home for him and Lacey <laughs> from win- winning the ring of honor world title, just winning it you're gonna have enough money to buy a home and well he didn't say like where <laughs> so he did say a starter home but still he didn't say I mean, but you know there's maybe just some like parts of the country where home prices are cheaper than others keep in mind this was 2006 which i guess was during the real estate bubble man if just two <laughs> years later when it crashes then he could buy a home don't get a subprime mortgage, Jimmy Jacobs. It would be just bad timing for that. You lose it all. But that would have been a great deleted scene in the big short, just Jimmy Jacobs buying a house being like, I just made four hundred dollars. <laughs> so I'm saying like yeah, we can give you credit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that 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 would have happened, I think, in, in some places in two thousand six. So I think that works. Um Sorry, you weren't done with this promo. No, I was just going to say, I thought this was a really interesting promo in this. It kind of, and we'll see this during the match too. Jimmy Jacobs was a very interesting character at this point because there's part of them that's dealing like with really serious, legit things. Like he is in some really dangerous matches. He really was in a match where he could have died. But then in the same promo, he will then veer into like, and I don't mean this in a negative way, the corniest, most pro wrestling insincere storyline which is you know oh you know like he goes in in the span of two sentences from like i almost could have died he's being completely honest to i could have died he's being completely honest to which is and the worst thing about that would have been my fake wrestling girlfriend who actually doesn't even really like me in storyline would have been without a boyfriend like well the like, thing like, is the, the thing yeah, is like on. so like these, I think this is really – these were really good ideas. Like he becomes – he's becoming a really interesting character and like we know that Jimmy Jacobs is a very creative guy. I think he wasn't quite there yet on like his promo delivery but I think you know once he would get there, I think you can sell that transition like because it is wrestling and there are going to be goofy aspects to whatever storyline you're telling, you know. So to mix the real and then like transition it to the absurd kind of, I think like – on a conceptual level, I think it does work. Like, I think this is a very good promo. It's just, you know, he's not totally experienced at delivering that kind of promo yet. So there's a little bit of like, I don't know, some of it doesn't totally ring true in the same way that the true parts did, um, if that makes sense. Well, um, it's interesting because he's trying to take the true and he's totally then trying to use that to fuel the clearly fake part. Like he's trying to yeah. say, you know, this has inspired me. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill you. For Lacey. Like, he's still trying to push it all to getting that feud over. Yeah, so it's funny. I was having a a bit of a debate, I guess, with a friend of mine who's not a wrestling fan, like, to the way we are. But, like, he follows it. He appreciates it on some level and, like, finds entertainment value in it. But he's also, like, a huge snob when it comes to, like, film and art. <laughs> and, like, like it's just, he just is. Like, the biggest snob I know. And, like, so, you know, he'll say, like... Wrestling, you know, when people, you know, people talk about the, the acting quality of the WWE bloodline storyline that's been going on. You know, we're, we're recording this in February of 2023. So like, that's the, the hot thing in wrestling at the time. And people talk about like, this is Emmy worthy acting and stuff. And he's like, no, like even good wrestling acting is worse than a bad TV show. And I was like, "Mm, I mean, I kind of like see what he's saying. Because wrestlers aren't actors. And my argument was, I think some of the scripted stuff can be just like really bad acting. But when a wrestler cuts a good promo, like in the traditional sense, that's different from acting. So it's not bad acting. It's just good promo. Like, cause they're not, cause when someone cuts a good promo, like they're just 
kind of telling their truth so they don't have to act. He disagrees yeah. with me. Like he's like, no, this is, this doesn't ring true because some of this stuff is so silly and and stuff like that. But I really do think that a good wrestling promo delivered well doesn't feel like acting. Like I'm not saying that wrestlers are like great actors because if they were, I think more of them would do amazing things when they get into movies and stuff. Whereas, you know, I think very few <laughs> have made that transition, but I just think that a good wrestling promo is something different from acting. And if you really sell that you like, if you get to a, a headspace where you believe what you're talking about, like I watched a, um, Sami Zayn's promo, not from raw, but from WWE.com where after raw, where it, it wasn't really, it didn't seem like it was scripted. So he just felt like it was, that guy talking didn't feel like he was trying to act and that felt true to me. It didn't feel like he was, you know, trying to be an actor because he's not an actor. He's a wrestler. Do you get what I'm saying? I know I'm kind of rambling, but do you understand, do you understand the distinction that I'm making? I I think that's a great point because you know what I was, I was saving this for someone I was going to write, but y'all give it. You're so lucky folks. You're going to get an early teaser. That's me being sarcastic by the way. But like, um, I feel like, Great wrestling acting, if there's such a thing, it is is very comparable to method acting in movies and stuff because they always say like not everyone agrees with method acting, not everyone does it. But the idea of method acting is you try and make yourself similar to the role you're playing to the idea that at that point you're no longer pretending or acting. Everything's second nature. You're reacting. And I feel like wrestling – its advantage with acting is when it's why people say like, oh, the best characters are yourself turn up to 11 and stuff is – the best wrestling promos are often when you're not really acting. Like, and that's when you, when, when your friend, your snobby friend was like, oh, there's not good acting in wrestling. I would say there's great, there's maybe not great traditional acting. There is great method acting in wrestling. Like, there is real emotion in something like when Cody Rhodes is talking to Dustin Rhodes after their match in AEW and crying and being like, I don't want you to retire yet, you know, and they're both crying. Like, that's real legitimate emotion and compelling in a way I think great acting is, you know? Yeah. I mean, and like, so, so like the example that I showed my friend to, I mean, you know, he, he, he watched enough wrestling that he was, he was familiar with this, but like I showed him the Arn Anderson promo from 90, 97, where he, he says he's has to retire and he offers Kurt Hennig his spot in the four horsemen. You know, it's a pretty, pretty famous promo. Arn Anderson, I think to me at least was very good at being believable in his promos. And, you know, I showed that to him and I was like, like, this is not bad acting. This is a guy just not acting. Like he's just saying how he feels. And he's, he's basically his argument was like, well, the part where he's talking about how he had to retire, I see what you're saying. But then when he transitions to, oh, and now I want you to, in his words, like join my best, my best friends club, like, you know, the four horsemen, that's when it starts <laughs> being goofy and ringing false. And I was like, mm, that's not true because that also meant a lot to him in real life. So yeah, like that, that in real life, that was his best friend's club. That was yeah. his best friend. Yeah. And that yeah. was, that's an important, I think part of Aaron Anderson's identity, you know, is his role in the four horsemen. So, you know, I, I think that people can be dismissive of wrestling acting because yes, when you get that like community theater stuff, these guys are not trained actors or guys and, and women are not trained actors. So it can come off as just bad acting, but a good wrestling promo to me, that's something different. And I think and with, actually, with, with Jimmy Jacobs here, like you could hear since he wasn't quite, you know, so experienced with the promos yet, you could see here the difference when he talked about the real versus the fake. Whereas to me, like with Arn Anderson, it's like, it's seamless. That's how I feel. I don't know. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I, I think that's a good point. Actually, and again, and again, this is because Jimmy just, Jacobs again was still very young. Like I'm not saying like he wasn't a good promo. Like yeah. this is, this was, him being also, very, he, he was being very ambitious here. And I think he did, pretty darn well all things considered yeah and also to say someone showed more scenes than Arn anderson is not a big criticism when you're saying yeah. someone wasn't quite as polished early on as maybe one of the greatest promo men ever in wrestling you know that like that's that's the highest bar um well, actually before we move on i just wanted to mention you actually you're i'm really glad you brought this up because you're actually very timely with this because i don't know if you saw this i forget who it was i would plug them if i saw it was someone on twitter yesterday i guess the uh the new Wrestling with Shadows DVD re-release just came out where uh, Bret Hart and uh, uh, Dave Meltzer do a commentary on And one of the big – this guy was kind of recapping little interesting nuggets that came from it. And I guess one of the more interesting ones that people were talking about was Dave Meltzer told uh, told Bret and Bret agreed that like you're – you know some people got on you that your promos weren't good. But it's like whenever he – Dave Meltzer said to Bret like whenever your promos was something – you were doing a promo about like a storyline you believed in. 
it was really good. And if it wasn't something you believed in, you know, that's when it was bad. And Brett completely agreed. He pointed out to, uh, the, uh, the feud he did with Jean-Pierre Lafitte, where it was all about stealing Bret Hart's jacket, where he's <laughs> like, you know, there's a feud where I did not believe in it. You know, I was like, this is, he said, you know, the matches were good, but I was just checked out because, you know, <laughs> not a great storyline, but it was something that he believed. And I think that's an example of what you're saying about like, Wrestling acting is good when people are committed to when they, when it's something they truly can get behind. Yes, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, and I think that's a very timely point you're making there. Actually, that's something that people were literally talking about yesterday. But yes, and I have one more question about this promo. So you mentioned you weren't sure if it was true about what Jimmy Jacobs said about what happened after that match with Whitmer. Like, did he in was he knocked out for yeah. a, a chunk of this match? Because I remember, didn't we like? kind of have a puzzled reaction when we read in the observer that like he had whiplash and that was it yeah and, and obviously if it was a concussion it wouldn't have happened at the start of the match but sometimes yeah like when you get a concussion it can wipe out a big chunk here and wasn't he still wrestling later that weekend was he, he, he wrestled was... yeah he wrestled every day that weekend so in fact, he in really fact, it, was, in fact it was whitmer that had to bow out the rest of the weekend because yeah. he hurt his ankle jacobs wrestled two Two match, you know, a match each of the next two days. But I guess that doesn't preclude a concussion in this era does not right. preclude you from wrestling a match, as we will see yeah. later in the show. Exactly. But um, that brings us to the Ring of Honor tag team title match. Austin Aries and Roderick Strong successfully defended the titles when they defeated uh, Colt Cabana and Nigel McGinnis in 21 minutes, eight seconds, when Strong made Nigel submit to what I guess would just call a regular Boston Crab. Uh, Matt. You know, this is on paper four really good wrestlers. They got plenty of time. What did you think about the match? You know, it was it was another one of the like weird matches. Like, first of all, just conceptually, I think it's weird. Like to suddenly have Cabana and Nigel in there together, challenging Aries and Strong. And I feel like there was a lack of urgency to the match that made it not feel like a title match the way some of the other recent Aries and Strong title defenses are. Like, I feel like they were just being like, let's do a house show match, but like kind of a maybe a little bit too long of one. Um, and that's what this felt like to me, like a house show match with quality wrestlers. So it was still kind of good, but didn't feel like maybe like an ROH level, like top tier title match. Um, first of all, um, just to, uh, connect to something you said earlier, Gabe comes in to say, this is the last defense of the ROH tag team titles because they're going to Dragon Gate to make them world tag team titles. So, I kind of appreciate that ROH has this concept, like it's a world title once you defend it in another part of the world. Um, Was that something that was like long established in other wrestling companies before this? Because I feel like my understanding of what a world title is is a company just says this is our world title, (laughs) and and then that's the world. Like like for like definitionally, like for WWE WWF growing up, like they had two singles titles. They for me they had the world title or WWF title, I guess, World Wrestling Federation title. And then they had the Intercontinental title. So like was then because it was the WWF title, not the world title, does that mean that like the Intercontinental was actually the world? Like I feel like they're just names, but I guess I appreciate that ROH tried to make it seem like something more than that. Yeah, I I agree. That's one of those examples I always talk about where Ring of Honor would go the extra mile sometimes, even if it was kind of weird. Like, and I appreciate that they just made the effort. So for those who don't maybe haven't followed us all the way through the podcast like r- the ring of honor world title was originally not the world title. it wasn't until 2003 when samoa joe finally became the first guy to defend it on a, a uk show they said okay now that he's defended it somewhere outside of the u.s we can call it a world title and they changed the name and so now they're going to do that with they're saying the winner of this match is going to defend in dragon gate so this is the last time it's ever just going to be the tag team title it's going to be the world title i was going to ask you because i thought I, I i i agree with you like i appreciate it but there's also part of me that was thinking it's also really silly because think about this way, Matt. I was going to ask you, how many countries do I have to visit to call myself a world traveler? Because if I told you, Matt, Matt, I'm a world traveler, and then you said, all right, Trevor, what countries have you been to? And I said, oh, you know, I've been to Japan and Canada where I'm from, and that's it. You would go, you're not a world traveler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can be in, ring, in the world of Ring of Honor. You're a world champion if you defend the title in America and literally one other country. Yeah. That, that, that makes it a world title. No, that's a – a excellent point. Um, like, like again, I appreciate that they make the effort, but it is when you. It's one of those things where if you think about it for more than a couple seconds, it starts to fall apart. But I still like that they make the effort. Also, 
kind of fucked up and they call WWE calls their belt the universal title when I feel like this is the only planet they've ever defended that title on. <laughs> but you know, maybe <laughs> um Yeah, I was gonna say maybe somebody won it in a tournament in Rio de Janeiro Venus. <laughs> <laughs> The wiki on yes. Pluto, <laughs> the okay, wikis, the wikis, funny. which is a, which is a a, a a getaway in on um, Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just name naming planets here, man. <laughs> naming planets here. Man. <laughs> um. All right. Anyway, this match. Um, that's what I'm talking <laughs> about. Um. So. I thought it was kind of funny that um, at the beginning they were showing clips of the Aries Cabana cage match. Like they were trying to like be like, oh, these teams have a history, but it's like it doesn't seem like the intensity between the two of them is carried over because they're just like doing respectful wrestling exchanges. Um, there is one spot that I enjoyed where um, Strong gets uh, Cabana in an arm bar, and Cabana, while selling the arm bar, goes, "Don't chop me, Roddy," and. <laughs> I thought maybe maybe that strategy works. Like just just tell the guy not to chop you, and it, it works. Um, there's another point where Nigel does a European uppercut to Strong, and someone in the crowd yells "In your face!" And I was like, "Is that where they got the name of the show from?" <laughs> I feel like it's possible. They like someone that they were like just like listening back on the DVD during the commentary and be like, "Hey, I like that." The guy oh said "In God. your face." <laughs> I, feel I like, didn't even notice that. Yeah, I feel like I should just go to indie shows and just like yell random things and hope that they name the show after some of the things that I yell. <laughs> There's like, the bathroom. If I yell like, this is great wrestling action, and then they name the show <laughs> Great Wrestling Action. I-, I think if I was an announcer, like my catchphrase would be like talking about how much wrestling there is. Like, like ladies and gentlemen, have you ever seen this much wrestling in your life? This is the most <laughs> wrestling we've ever had. <laughs> But I would let's, do that, I would do that, that on like every gonna be, show. That's going to be tough though, because like nowadays, unless you're like an AEW pay per view, like it's going to be the answer. Like, no, I, this I, is not the most. It's not I, even close. I'd say it anyway. It's wrestling. You gotta, you gotta sell it. <laughs> I would more wrestling that you could shake a stick at. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so you know they, you know, strong hits, hard chops. Nigel does the headstand. Um, but uh, Ares holds him up so Roderick can chop him upside down a few times until Colt breaks it up. Um, then Ares and Strong get the advantage over McGinnis. Ares, he like he milks the crowd for a while. Nigel gets the headstand again, and this time it works. See, it's the back kick elbow combo thing. Tags in Colt. Well, again, not dramatically enough for me. I feel like they were not doing much with the hot tags here like because – Nigel was worked on for a while. This is another thing about ROH tag matches is they have multiple heat sequences, but sometimes they decide that only one of them is worthy of a hot tag. And the others will be like, you work on a guy for six minutes, but it's not time for the hot tag. So the guy just kind of casually tags out. Have you noticed that on some of these longer tag matches? Yeah, yeah there's definitely some times where it's like, you think this is going to be a great hot tag. And then it's just kind of like, it just peters out. Like the guy's just like, yep. Like there's been times yeah. where a guy will be controlled, like you just said, for like five, six minutes, and then like some move will just miss, and the guy will just walk over to the corner. Yeah, well, like, that, yeah. That's, that's what this was here. And yeah. then, yeah, so Cabana's in. They do kind of a kind of a meandering segment with Cabana and Nigel getting some holds on Aries, and Aries fighting out. It kind of feels repetitive after a while. Um, uh, Nigel during this part, at one point, he does the snot blow on Strong, who's in the corner, which lures him in. But Nigel doesn't really capitalize on the distracted referee. So, like, he's just, like, luring Strong in to do nothing. Um, so now and Nigel whips Aries into the corner but misses a running uppercut, and Aries tags in Strong. And, like, Strong treats that as a hot tag. He does, like, he does all of his big drop kicks and into Gary, and they all look great. Gibson driver, Cabana breaks that up. They do the double team back, uh, backbreaker and chop brainbuster combo on Nigel. Get a two count on that, and then Nigel like he just tags out after a random drop toe hold. So again, another tag that they could have done a better job with. But Colt does treat it like a hot tag. He hits a double quebrada, gets a two count on Strong. Nigel does a third headstand, and Cabana throws Strong into the corner so Nigel can hit an upside down mule kick on him. Um, and then str- – I love what I get to write this. Strong avoids the flying asshole, but Cabana <laughs> hits a – his like spinny tornado suplex thing for two. Um, at one point, Cabana miss, uh, misses a missile drop kick, and Strong locks in the stronghold. And Ares tries to hold Nigel back, but Nigel kicks him off. 
breaks up the hold. Um, Nigel eventually hits the Tower of London on Strong off of Colt's shoulders, which looked really nasty. Ares broke that up. So Nigel did yet another headstand, but Ares comes in with the corner drop kick and then right into the sick kick for, I think, the best near fall of the match. Huge pop, ROH chant even for that. And then finally, Ares and Strong hit the missile drop kick power bomb combo, but Colt breaks that up after they try to pin Nigel. Strong goes into a Boston Crab. Nigel tags. Um, um, oh yeah, uh, Nigel taps. I meant to write uh, so to to the Boston Crab. So you know, like I said, fun ideas and spots in there. The middle portion to me dragged, and I think the match just kind of felt disjointed at times. I didn't really like all the random like non hot tags, but. You know, did get hot near the end. These are four great wrestlers, so it was entertaining the whole way through. Crowd was good because they're, they're always good in this uh, in this venue. I I found it to be a bit disappointing and probably a little too long, but I think I mean still a fine match. I think I like this slightly more than you, but this was one of those interesting matches that occasionally happens where I'm I was kind of on the fence going in. Is it like good or very good? And then like listen to you. Just now, I was like, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. And by the end, I was like, you kind of pushed me like to the side, one of the sides I was teetering on, which is, yeah, this is good, but there's definitely some things wrong with it. I agree about the kind of almost like the low stakes house show kind of vibe at, at some point and the, and the problems you have with the hot tags and stuff. I, I felt like this is one of those matches where the ingredients really don't combine together into something larger than the ingre- individual ingredients, but yet all the individual wrestlers, are really good wrestlers. So it was, there's still enjoyment to be had, but yeah, it, the one part I thought where it did kind of come a bit more together, it became something a little bit special for a second was, I really like that sequence where Nigel and Colt are kind of Matt wrestling Aries together. Like they're both standing over Aries and they're kind of like one guy will like flip or turn Aries into a certain position. And then the other guy will put him in a hold. Like they're kind of like t- helping each other put hit holds on them. And I thought, okay, there's like an interesting bit of, you know, you know, what you like from tag team wrestling, like two guys kind of doing things they couldn't do in a singles match together, kind of playing off each other. But most of this match just feels like individual performances. And, you know, it, it's good wrestling. I, I think Nigel and Roddy still always have really good chemistry together. I love whenever Nigel tries to block the chops. I always feel like they just have an extra little bit of intensity when they're alone together. But, but yeah, this is nothing you have to go absolutely out of your way to see and maybe a little bit disappointing considering the talent involved. Um, Good wrestling, but, but just but also just like so much wrestling. Like there was just more yeah, wrestling yeah. here than you could ever imagine. That's yeah, another thing, that's another thing I would say. Now. More wrestling than you could ever imagine. <laughs> I would love if that became a criticism we could say for matches like, you know, this was a good match, but it went on too long. Like I couldn't shake a stick at it, and that's too much wrestling. Like, yeah, just too much I wrestling. wrestling that, yeah, I just, I just want the stick to be able to cover – just enough to shake at it. Yes, this, this, match, this match was good, but it just had too much wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've definitely seen some matches that we can apply that criticism to, but, um, I thought a couple interesting notes were things that happened before and after the match. The first one was before. I liked that he, Nigel always during this era, he did the intro where he like slides under the ring apron and kind of, you have to kind of see it to really understand it, but he kind of like scoots under the ring and then stands up and Colt tries to do it, but he can't. And then he kind of does on a second attempt when he does in tandem with Nigel, which again, kind of the more we were talking about earlier, going back to the kind of the more cutesy, cutesy, goofy stuff that Nigel plays along with it. And then and the commentary at one point late in the match or something, it stresses something that they've stressed a few times lately. And it's interesting because it's clearly something Gabe is really pushing the announcers to talk about, which is that no Ring of Honor title has changed hands in 2006. And, you know, which of these champions is the best? And I really think he's just pushing that because knowing that they're still not going to – any of them, none of the titles are going to change hands still for a bunch more shows. Like I think he almost wants to create this feeling among fans that like, oh, they keep calling attention to it. One of these titles is going to change hands any second now. When they really aren't for a little while still. We still got a ways to go. I like the, then, I like that um that angle of it though. You know, I think that's a a good thing to make a an issue out of. Yeah, I think it's a good yeah. hook. Yeah, they're they're putting over every champion. They're saying like we've got three really good strong champions you could debate, you know, and you really could the way they were booked at this point, especially seeing how Nigel, even the the which was the pure title, kind of a mid cartel, but Nigel had just beaten Danielson, the world champion. So you you really could at this point in in storyline argue that any of the champions were the best. So um for sure. No, I think yeah, that and and I don't think at this point in his reign. I mean, obviously, you know, Danielson had by far the legendary reign in this 
in this company. But I don't think he's so much towering over the others at this point. Um, you know, his just goes on a lot longer than the others. And he's yet to have, I'd say, his two most legendary matches of his reign um, yeah. at this point. And to be, and also, like, this is a storyline thing you could only do during an era like this. Like, not to criticize these guys, but like, you couldn't have done this, said this with a straight face when John Walters was pure champ, or when Sal Renaro and Tony, Ma- again, no offense to any of these guys, or Sal Renaro and Tony Mock were tag champs. You couldn't say, like, we don't know which champion is, is, is hot, is the supreme right now. Like, yeah, they just were in a very sure. good, sure. good slot right here, you know, with their champs. For sure. Like, this, um, this was, I mean, just, uh, yeah, a, just a great era for their titles. They just had, they did legitimately have three extremely strong champions and one Roderick strong yeah. champion. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. I'm <laughs> glad you did not let me down. Um, <laughs> next up, we have, the second instance on – well, actually the third – the first instance of things going crazy and wrong on the show was the match so bad it could not be aired. The second was the broken chandelier. We, now we've got the third, and we got at least two more after this, Matt, of things going wrong. Well, actually, at least one more after this. Um, and the thing that goes wrong is not the thing you might think. So next up, we had the Ring of Honor World Title Number 1 Contendership Grudge Match. BJ Whitmer and Jimmy Jacobs, scored to the ring by Lacey, went to a no contest. In 1434, when, as I wrote to myself in my notes, after BJ Whitmer powerbombed Jimmy Jacobs off the turnbuckle into the fucking crowd, I wrote in my notes, that, that it became a no contest after that, and neither guy could get up. Um, there is a certain kind of energy when Whitmer and Jacobs wrestle each other. There's like this tension where you feel like something could go wrong or something could get hurt at any time. Now, granted, I'm sure a big part of that is because something did go wrong and two guys did get hurt the last time they wrestled before this night. Um, that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting and giving you that atmosphere, but that atmosphere still exists and it gives you, there's this real, there's this little extra something when you guys when you watch these two wrestle from this pure on this point here on and um, yes and, and and not to drop out the match but I just want to say no, like it shows that the Anglin feud I think have been pretty successful because I feel like this match at the beginning felt like a big deal match in a way that no Jimmy Jacobs singles match in ROH had ever felt like before and it's one of those weird things about wrestling right where as bad as it is like sometimes bad things help wrestling like it's not good those guys nearly died and and bj whitmer broke his ankle and jimmy jacobs at least got whiplash and maybe a concussion depending on if that pro was truthful but it is also unequivocally true it helped both their careers it gave the momentum it made the feud better i mean when something like that does happen you have to uh, you know take advantage of it right like i don't think there's anything wrong with that i mean it already happened so you might as well make the best of it so um yeah, the, the, there's this chemistry between these two guys. I think it's more, though, than the fact that something went wrong in their last match. I think part of the vibe these matches have is there's just something about the chemistry between Whitmer and Jacobs where it feels like they're willing to go the extra mile and take extra risks. And they even just bump a little harder. Like stuff in the – even the very start of this match where um, Jacobs attacks Whitmer in the aisle and uh, as Whitmer's making his entrance and, and Jimmy ends up getting whipped into the barric- barricade, the bumps Jacobs is taking just feel a little bit bigger than you would expect. And you can see – Already after he gets with the barricade, he takes it so hard when he stands up, you can see his back already has like a red welt on. Like they're just – when these two guys wrestle each other, they just go for it. And um, there are other ma- moments in this match I feel that have the energy like Whitmer gets a cut, a hard way cut right above his eye. And Jacobs, way before he ever does the famous blood angle with the Briscoes, you know, he does the war paint with the blood, although the camera angle guy doesn't really get a good angle on unfortunately. Um and the spot you mentioned alluded to earlier with Green Lantern fan, which for people that are newcomers, Green Lantern fan, famous, famous wrestling fan who um, attended a lot of wrestling shows, always, usually in the front row, usually wearing a green, always wearing a Green Lantern shirt or jersey of some kind, timing the matches. So, you know, he would get on certain people. He was a, a, a famous fan, so to speak. At one point um, here – well, just so, just uh, before, before you say it, this was not the spot yeah. I'm talking about. That comes later, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so the, there's a spot here where um, BJ forces a kiss on Lacey. Lacey freaks out on the outside afterwards. You know, how dare he do this? And Green Lantern fan, you know, he likes to rail on certain wrestlers. He goes, uh, shut up. And she turns around and she hawks a gigantic fucking loogie on Green Lantern fan. Like, and I, I, still, I still feel like that's only the second – Worst thing that happened to him on camera on this show. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. So, like, the crowd, 
Um, and so, yeah, the match continues. They tease us. They, they tease a repeat of the famous power bomb spot gone, gone wrong where, um, they tease going to do a top rope power bomb mid match. And you hear a big going to what you said earlier about how, like, right from the start, the crowd's reacting to stuff. The crowd, you know, when, when they tease that spot, everyone knows what that's teasing. You know, they were all aware of it. And so, Whitmer, like a lot of wrestlers, he also takes advantage of wrestling a guy as small as Jacobs. It's something you see a lot often in Jimmy Jacobs matches. Like, it does spots against Jacobs that he probably can't do with 90% of the wrestlers he works like, where um, Jacobs jumps off the top rope and Whitmer grabs him in midair, like by like the head and shoulders and doesn't let Jacobs' feet touch the ground and then turns it into a suplex. Like, there's only a certain size of guy he can do that to, and Jimmy's that guy. And then when Whitmer does a tombstone, like, he's not just doing a tombstone. He's not even doing a sit-out tombstone. He's doing a jumping sit-out tombstone, which, again, I imagine you're more confident in doing that when it's a guy light enough that you can really be secure. And again, those spots come off really cool that they're even doing them. And then it ends, you know, the spot everyone remembers this match for, it ends with one of the, what I would say, Matt, is in my opinion, I'll, I'll be curious if you agree. I, I, I have to think you agree. This is one of the craziest spots in Ring of Honor history, playing off their last match. Um, they brawl into the crowd a little bit, and you see a bunch of the students, they're like, huh, why are, well, there's that's a lot of students there, and they're kind of clearing everyone out even after they, um, get back out into the ring from the crowd and then you quickly realize why because they go to the top rope except this time bj whitmer power bombs jimmy jacobs off the top turnbuckle into the crowd and the camera angle of this is incredible because they just show you the the hard cam and it's an incredible angle because what happens is you don't see them like, like you literally just see jacobs i mean whitmer holding jacobs for the power bomb jumping off the top turnbuckle and they just disappear into the crowd they just get swallowed up by the crowd and the cr- the fans go nuts it's insane it's one of the one of the times in wrestling where it's actually better that you don't see the landing because from what i've read online it sounds like neither guy was hurt and that the students did their job and they broke the fall and caught caught them but instead you you know your imagination can just go crazy because you don't see the landing you just see them disappear and this is also the perfect building to do that spot because the new yorker as we've talked about they're so close to the ring to the point where on one side of the ring i believe the side he jumps to like the 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 uh, barricades right up against the ring where if you cr- walk along that side of the ring, you're like cr- like crunched between the barricade and the ring. So if there's any side of the ring in any building where you're going to jump from the top rope into the crowd, that's the side because you're almost in the crowd already in the ring. So it works out perfectly. And yeah, I thought, and actually maybe thinking in retrospect, maybe that's not, maybe that's why the aisle was narrower. It's not really because of the more people, but it's because they were planning on doing that spot and they wanted less distance for those guys to travel to get into the crowd. Yeah, I'm no. not sure because there has been other New Yorker shows where the barricade was very close against the ring, but not, not like this. I, I promise. Yeah. yeah. I also wonder if that, that that was part of the thought too. Was just the idea that this is a spot we could only do at the New Yorker because you maybe you could do it at other places, but like again, I feel like this is a building because you're so close to the crowd. It's tailor made if you ever wanted to do a spot like this. This is the building to do it in. Um, I thought this was a really good match. Like as far as a wrestling match, maybe low, very good. I could see other people if you don't buy into the energy, if you don't know the history, you might see it's just a pretty good but not show stealing indie undercard match that has one incredible insane spot at the very end but to me that energy i talked about earlier it elevates everything i would say up one level if you really wanted to make a criticism against this match i would say it felt like before they did the big spot at the end that they were just getting into like the really hot near falls and starting to hit their bigger offense like they left some moves on the table and you could i could see people being disappointed like man they could have gone another couple minutes before they did the big spot but in a way i even like that because it almost makes it you you don't see that spot coming because it still feels like there's a bit of the match to go. And a lot of times when you have a match with like a disputed or no contest finish and a big thing like this, they still milk every spot they can that they would normally do before they get to the end. They don't do that here. You don't see every single finishing move these two could do. You know, I don't think, you know, BJ breaks out like the wrist clutch exploder. He doesn't hit that or anything, things like that. Or, you know, the Contra coat. Well, I don't know. Did Jimmy do the Contra coat? I'm not even sure. I don't think so. But either – but yeah, like they leave stuff on the table and go right to that spot. So you're almost not expecting like, oh shit, this is the end. They're doing this right now. This is the end. And again, unforgettable spot. You know, if you, this is one of the spots they played in clip packages and stuff ad nauseum, just a legendary spot for Ring of Honor. Yeah. I mean, I, I, 
I had, I maybe didn't like the match quite as much as you, but like I still thought it was really good. I just it's not that they didn't do enough near falls; that there was like a little bit of maybe disjointedness earlier. But yeah, overall between the atmosphere and the big spot, it's super memorable and still like you know still quite good. Like I, definitely an exciting match to watch. Um, and w- the way you described the spot where you can't really see how they land. That was exactly my live experience. Like from where I was sitting, I didn't wow. see the landing. So I didn't know that they landed on a whole pile of students. I was like, did they land on fans? Like I was I just, I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, how the hell did they do that? And I, um, you know, I didn't even get to see really that they cleared out all those chairs, um, which, you know, really kind of telegraphed the spot if you know what's coming, you know? But um, yeah. yeah, so live, it was even that much crazier like it was just chaos at that point, which, and you'll get to some of the chaos that ensues after, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was just, it's such, it was such a memorable live moment. I, it kind of overwhelmed any memory of the match that I had. So watching the match back, it was like, I kind of was watching it with fresh eyes and yeah, it was, it was good. And I, and I actually like when, if you're going to do a, a, a disputed or like no contest finish like that, I like that you don't, take us through the emotional highs and lows of this epic match only to pull the finish yeah. out from under us. You know, that's often a pet peeve. It's like, Oh God, that match was so awesome. And that's the finish, you know, like, so I feel like if you're going to do a finish like that, don't give us the entire epic match, give us a little bit of hot action and then do that finish and then save the epic match for when you're going to give a finish, which is what they do. So I, uh, I appreciated that. I think this whole segment was, went really well. And I think until, this the, post, is a, a, until, the, until the post match. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is also one of the best examples of, um, or a really good example at least of a non finish not being disappointing because I don't see how anyone could be disappointed or felt like they did not see something special at the end. But yet having a non finish for this match really works out well for Gabe because these are two guys. This feud's giving each guy momentum, and so by doing a non finish, neither guy has to lose. He um. Then is the spoiler for the next show. They're going to do a th- since this was supposed to be a number one contendership for the Ring of Honor World Title. Instead, they do a three way for the next show. And I actually think that match being a three way has more interest at this point than it just being Danielson versus Jacobs or Danielson at Whitmer. Because yeah, I feel neither, like neither of those has- singles matches would really pop. And I think the three way, you know, obviously that still wasn't the hottest match ROH could have done at the moment, but yeah, it, it adds a layer of a layer of intrigue to that match that wouldn't have otherwise been there. And it allows these guys for the second straight time they've wrestled. It's like a big talked about match, but they didn't really do everything they could. Like you, I still feel like we haven't seen in term what the, the best they're capable of in terms of just a straight up wrestling match. But yet the two matches they've had in terms of just getting over and getting talked about incredibly successful, but they still haven't pulled out everything they can do. Well, yeah. So, well, and the, the Whitmer and Jacobs match where they pull out everything they can do to be fair is not a straight up wrestling match either, but yeah. still. So one last thing I think before I get to the after match stuff that Matt's talk alluding to, which is I think this is going to be the photo for the show. So people that are wondering why the hell you're seeing this photo, there is a moment during this match. And I thought as soon as I saw it, that's the photo for the show. Um, Jimmy and DJ are brawling in the front row and a fan right next to him so close to, to the wrestlers that he's, his arm is literally touching Jimmy Jacobs arm just keeps flipping off the cameraman over and over with this really unsettling unbreaking stare. He just does not break eye contact, doesn't blink. It wasn't me. I swear. The, yeah, he ignores the action. These guys are brawling basically so close that they're touching him, and he's just not even – he's just flipping off the cameraman over and over again. And I was just like, that is something different. But um, something else happened that did not – another thing that did not make the DVD. We'll go to the Observer. The most talked about thing on the show was the Whitmer versus Jimmy Jacobs match, and he goes through that. Um, so, uh, again, like that's another thing credit to these guys this is a show with kenta versus danielson versus um uh samo joe a show where the chandelier broke and people wrestled in broken glass and these guys were still the most talked about thing on the show that to me that's a feat and then dave will go to there was also an incident mentioned to us by a half dozen fans after the jacobs whitmer powerbomb into the stand spot a fan threw a roll of toilet paper at jacobs adam pierce was there checking to see if jacobs was okay pierce stopped helping jacobs and went over the guardrail to find the fan going through the extremely jam-packed stands he caught the guy and according to one report was quote practically choking the guy unquote before the rest of the crew kicked the guy out 
Another person said security was kicking the guy out and he was already leaving when Pierce, quote, threw him against the wall and choked him until another fan convinced him to stop, unquote. Another person who was right there said the toilet paper hit Whitmer in the face and both the ref and Pierce went after the fan. This report was from someone who said he was shoved out of the way by Pierce to get at the fan and, quote, Pierce slammed the guy against the wall and Pierce and a ref started swearing and yelling at him and got him kicked out of the building. Building. It was a really scary situation, and it could have resulted in a lot worse than it did, unquote. The consensus was the guy should have been ejected, although the throwing toilet paper at wrestlers sounds to me like it either has to be accepted or stopped, because right now, fans are encouraged to do it during Rave's ring intros, and on this night, the ring was covered in it when Rave was announced. There was, uh, yeah, we didn't no mention that. There was a lot of toilet paper. I think possibly the most toilet paper I've ever seen for a Rave entrance. Yeah, a huge amount. So Dave continues, but Pierce had no need to do what he did. Dave Sapolsky downplayed it. Quote, a fan threw toilet paper and he was ejected. They're making a big deal out of nothing, unquote. As a general <laughs> guy, <laughs> as a classic, like, kind of perturbed, like, why are you even asking me about this Gabe quote from this era? As a general guy, a fan should never cross the barrier because – this is Dave again talking. A fan should never cross the barrier because if they do, the wrestlers have to assume they're up to no good and have the right to defend themselves. Fans shouldn't throw things at wrestlers, but it should be the job of security to take care of it if they do. But we have a fine line now, such as when companies encourage – to throw things, which WCW most definitely did, for example, as Eric Bischoff thought fans throwing stuff at heels made for better television. But once you start down that path, someone can and often does get hurt. Here, the toilet paper is an encouraged part of the show, but at a different time in the show, Pierce was out there in a security-like fashion in a crowded building. The incident ended up not being major, but could have been. Okay, so first, man, I have some thoughts, but yeah, do you well, remember anything about this live? Uh, I, I think I remember seeing, like, Pierce, like, kind of climbing over chairs at something but i don't i didn't see like the aftermath or how it started or anything like that um so i i don't have too much insight into this yeah so this is not i believe this is even the first time we've talked about adam pierce at a show like policing something and certainly not the t- far from the first time we've talked about ring of honor wrestlers everyone from joe to punk who have gone into crowds after fans when they perceive that the fan is you know crossed the barrier gone over the line in some way maybe he really um, was the lieutenant commissioner <laughs> I, I, we've, I, we've talked about this way long ago, I believe, and including reading probably Dave writing this. He would always brown the, the WCW comparison, but during the era of when uh, Ring of Honor did the fake riots, and you know Dave was would always wearing stuff like that. Like if you encourage the fans in a work setting to that they can throw stuff, that they can touch the wrestlers, that's going to embolden the fans when they shouldn't do that stuff, and that creates like a dangerous precedent. And to a large degree, I agree. At the same time, I wish we lived in a world where wrestling fans were smart enough to know like it's okay to throw toilet paper at Jimmy J. I mean Jimmy Ray, but that doesn't mean you get to do anything else during the show or throw toilet paper at two wrestlers that just did an insane spot. Like I, I, I would love a word that if we lived in a world where people were just smart enough to see the line and we wouldn't. I mean, almost, have to worry almost, about, almost everybody is. To be fair, yes, that's that's the problem. You know, it, it's ninety nine percent people, and then one person. I, my opinion, I've gone through this before. Always is. I feel like wrestlers should not police these things. Like Dave mentions, oh, wrestlers have to protect themselves. Well, this doesn't sound like yeah, Pierce had to protect anybody. It was a roll of toilet paper, and by all accounts, it sounds like he then went on a search for a fan that was not near him to like get after him. So to me, that's not protection. That's you no, that's, getting that's, pissed that's, off. That, that's a hot temper kind of situation for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like it's also – it still not it shouldn't be – like that should be security's job. And also – if I'm a wrestler, I don't want to risk things. Like, you never know who's out there. You know, someone could be a complete nut. Someone could have a knife. Like, I wouldn't want to do that shit. I would, I would tell someone else to do it, but right. I feel and, like wrestlers at, re- at a big arena, I think you're pretty safe in knowing that someone doesn't have a knife because they, they, all the security yeah. scanners you go through. But I, I don't even remember if they did pat downs at these old ROH shows. They might have done like very cursory ones, but like, certainly not enough to be safe for sure. <laughs> So again, all this didn't make the DVD, but again, I just want to point out, Matt, you were there live. Like, you probably don't remember how you felt, but like at this point in the show, in the previous hour, you had seen a chandelier break and guys in broken glass. Then that DJ Whitmer, Jimmy Jacobs, insane power bump to the crowd spot. As you mentioned, you saw what we see on the home release. So it just, you don't even know how it, how it happened. And then you see some kind of curveball where Adam Pierce goes after a fan. Like, 
This is a crazy show, and it, we're not. It, it was a crazy show, and I brought a fr- I brought a friend who was not like a you know big. ROH. I think he'd been to one other ROH show with me months earlier, and like so, like I was just like, oh my god, can you believe this? Like, isn't this way cooler than <laughs> WWE? Like, this is all sorts of insanity here. And the other yeah. thing, as far as like my feelings was, I was so fucking excited for that main event. Like, I mean, I, we haven't talked about it yet because we'll do it when we uh, when we get to it. But like. Oh my God! What a dream match that was. The the, the yeah. atmosphere for this show was it wasn't Joe versus Kobashi, but it was like whole like this this you know, everyone is real was really up for this, and I definitely was. Yeah. So uh, next we get an ad for Ring of Honor's merch site as usual. Then since it's intermission, we go backstage. Davy Richard shows off his crazily swollen eye. It looks like an alien growth. It is really swollen. Uh, it's starting to black, and Davy says it hurts like hell. But probably not as much as Jimmy Rave's arm and his ego. Richard says Rave got beat twice by a rookie. It's motivation to – he says the swollen eye inspires him. It's motivation to disrupt the usual rookie logic when people think he should be a nobody at this point. He says that Rave will find that out that Davey Richards is somebody. It is interesting that in this pro – Richard kind of like saying like the subtext out loud, like, like, like the idea of, oh, when Ring of Honor rookies usually don't like get off to hard, hot starts. Like he's basically saying that in this promo. Yeah, he's he definitely but, they're definitely giving him like a an kind of a I don't know if arrogance is the right word, but a super confident persona right off the yeah. bat. The other thing is a very interesting stylistic choice to have the entire promo just be zoomed in on his eye instead of like seeing his <laughs> mouth, you know, when he talks. Any time in Ring of Honor you have an injury on your face and you do a promo, that Zoom is getting used awfully. <laughs> it was plentiful use of Zoom. Like, like man, oh, man. Um, yeah, what is this? What is this, 2020? Because they're Zooming right in there. <laughs> Get it? Because uh, the Zoom, people, people did a lot of video conferencing in 2020 is what I'm getting it's at. Just the this is the best. Uh, this I, I'm I'm being serious. This might be the best episode we've ever done. Um, hmm. Ring of okay. Honor, top of the class. Go on. <laughs> no, I just said. Uh, I just said. Okay, if you say so. I, I, I'm enjoying it. Um, Ring of Honor, top of the class trophy title match. Shane Hagedorn successfully defends his newly won trophy that he won on the last show when he defeats Mitch Franklin via submission in three minutes twenty one seconds when he made him tap to a bulldog choke. I would say this is your standard Ring of Honor student match, but probably on the low end of them because there was a bit of awkwardness here where uh, Hagedorn, Hagedorn at one point trips as he just runs the ropes and uh, Franklin almost slips off the top turnbuckle. So, you know, it's it's a short student match where usually there's not much wrong to him, but this match did have a little bit of hiccups. And uh, But to be fair, to, to, in the student's defense, it seemed like everyone did on this show. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if there's ever a show to not get on guys for something going wrong, it's this show. Um very short, not much of note. Hagedorn wins out of nowhere with the bulldog choke. Uh, before the match, uh, Hagedorn knocked a hat off a kid's head, which I always enjoy. And, uh, like in real life, you always comment- enjoy it? <laughs> I, I love – because I always go, man, this is refreshing. I can feel the cool breeze now. Thank you. But um, <laughs> Pr- Prezak says Whitmer and Jacobs are being rushed to the hospital, so they're selling during this match how serious that is, which, again, we've talked about before um, – in kayfabe in Ring of Honor, BJ Whitmer just constantly going to the hospital at this point, like, <laughs> breaking his neck. Breaking- <laughs> but I also feel like, like in real life, he probably had to go a lot during yeah, twenty. Yeah, this was two thousand six. Yeah, this is a a very rough time for uh, BJ Whitmer physically. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that match. Well, um, I, I I will say this was was this Mitch's ROH DVD debut. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I can check. I don't that remember. I don't remember reviewing a match. Of his. I mean, like in the ring. I know he's like appeared, but I um I don't remember reviewing a match of his before. Though I will say, I thought that the finish was very cool. Like the reversal of the Irish whip and like taking um, Franklin over in a reverse headlock into the choke uh, submission I, for the tap out. I thought that was a really cool way of getting to that finish. So that is one high mark for this match. So for people who don't know, Mitch Franklin, the future Grizzly Redwood, he lost to Ricky Reyes at This Means War in 2005 in 22 seconds. I'm shocked that neither of us remember that, Matt. I'm sure it was very memorable. <laughs> and and he wrestled a bunch of dark matches. He was part of the – ooh, the unscripted three-way dance. Him versus Pele Primo versus Adam Pierce went 50 seconds. That was that show where Pele Primo cut a pretty good oh, promo yeah. before yeah, the, the yeah, match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we – okay, so – seen a lot of Mitch and, Franklin so far. And then he uh, lost to Bobby Dempsey in two minutes, 15 seconds at the fourth anniversary show. I don't know if that made the uh, DVD or not. Bo- to, Bobby, not sure. to Bobby Dempsey? 
Yeah, Bobby Dempsey, it says here, on Cage Match. I don't feel like that was on the DVD. And then he lost the homicide in 2 minutes 35 seconds at Supercard of Honor. So apparently Mitch Franklin had like 18 matches we forgot about. On, and that's included – That's then there's a bunch of dark matches in addition to that. So. Yeah, I feel like a couple of those matches that you mentioned didn't make the DVD. But probably a few of them did. I know that Pierce but, one. Ma- the Pierce one definitely did. But Matt, you know, the irony of, of that, uh, all these matches we forgot about, um, looking at Cage Match, Mitch Franklin does not have another match that makes DVD for the rest of the year. <laughs> so this oh, is boy. it for him. He uh, wrestles uh, six dark matches for the rest of the year. Well, but, it was smart of him to find that gimmick. <laughs> so after the match, Adam Pierce comes to the ring. He gets on the mic. And he says, the feud with CZW is all coming to a head at Cage of Death. So this is the moment, Ring, like, I don't think it was announced just at this second, but we're now in the timeline where th- the fact that Ring of Honor is going to run a Cage of Death match coming up on a future show, it- it's-, it's been announced. It- they're building to that now. That's the end for that feud's in sight now. Um, Pierce says, as lieutenant commissioner, he has a little bit of stroke in this company, so he demands Claudio Casanelli's music to be played and Claudio to get his ass kicked. Out Claudio comes to the crowd. Pierce jumps him when he gets to ringside, and we get Adam Pierce defeating Claudio Casanelli by disqualification in 8 minutes, 58 seconds, when Chris Hero comes to the ring and he hits Pierce with the CCW title. Uh, Matt, what would you think about this? You know, Pierce's war against CCW continues. Uh, yeah, uh, it's another, you know, I haven't been super impressed with Claudio during this like few month period in ROH when he turns heel. Like I feel like his, I don't know. I feel like his work quality declines a bit because this is another match where it just felt super basic. You know, he was just Claudio was just healing. Um, you know, there was just it was there was a hot crowd, um, so it was entertaining enough. But you know, Pierce, you know they they, they brawl a bit. You know, Pierce slaps Claudio. Um, you know, he doesn't let his doesn't let him get his shirt and tie off at the beginning. You know, Claudio eventually, you know, he hits some European uppercuts. We get a "Let's Go Pierce" chant at one point, which is something I don't think we hear very much during his entire run in ROH. Right? Yeah. He's very rarely a babyface, um, except for this angle. I think but, we may have heard one maybe before this ever. Yeah, in Ring of and I get. I'm guessing we won't hear too many more because he turns heel again in like three shows. But. Um, there is one point where Claudio does a snap mare and takes off his tie to do like a sneaky tie choke on Pierce, which don't show Justin Roberts this match because it'll trigger <laughs> bad memories. Um, but, you know, Pierce does his comeback. He does, you know, very standard old school babyface comebacks, punches, roundhouses, gets cut off a few times, gets choked a few times with a shirt and a tie. You know, Pierce does a comeback, hits a backdrop. Um, at one point, Pierce hits a gut wrench superplex, which if you can tell me how many times you've seen that move, I can't think of too many, um, but to get it in this match, um, at one point we start hearing a fuck you hero chant as Pierce puts Claudio on the top rope and drops him chest first on his knees. And so you could tell, obviously, Hero's making his way into the crowd, although the announcer, through the crowd, although the announcers uh, ignore it. And then once Pierce goes on top, Hero just runs in, hits him with the belt for the disqualification. So yeah, basic match, not very memorable, not very good, but hot crowd. So it wasn't terribly boring. Yeah. Um, I thought this was the worst match of the show, at least of the ones that made the DVD. Um, it was just average at best. I would say this is a match that would, uh, a large, not the whole match, but cause there was a few big spots like, the gut wrench superplex, but uh, large portions of this match, I think, would fit right in on a random like 1987 episode of WAF Prime Time, which normally is not something you get about Ray Warner for better and for worse, usually for better. I mean, um, Pierce at one point even inexplicably does the points to his hand, and says this is where the power lies catchphrase. So like very throwbacky here. Um, much of Pierce's offense in this match is just punching and then getting pissed off and kind of semi hulking up when he takes offense from Claudio only then to get cut off by Claudio cheating. And like you mentioned, Claudio chokes with his tie, with his shirt, he eye gouges, he takes time between the fan moves to gloat to the audience. So very basic in a lot of ways, old school kind of match. It, it, it's, it doesn't feel substantial enough to the point where it almost feels like when hero comes in that like the whole match is just an excuse for Chris Hero to come out. It, and, does, it um, doesn't feel more substantial than just a lot of like the random brawls that they have in between matches on previous shows. You know what I mean? Like they have yeah. a lot of just like P- Adam Pierce, Claudio related brawling um, on a lot of these CZW era 
ROH shows. And even though this is an official match, this doesn't really feel so different from those. And even going emphasizing how you know weird this feels for most Ring of Honor matches. How often Ring of Honor do you see like just a brazen DQ like this, like not even an event of one, like just guy comes to the ring with the title, but like that's pure WWF WCW. Like in the late nineties, just yeah, I'm, it's time for the end of the match. Gonna hit you with this thing. But um, one thing I did note when the match when commentary talks about how Ring of Honor will be doing a cage of death match coming up because John they 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 do in storyline the idea that. Ring of Honor want uh, some people might have forgotten this. Ring of Honor they claim in this is storyline wanted to do a steel care steel cage warfare match because that was Ring of Honor's you know cage gimmick. And then they say the John Zandig said the only way CZW wrestlers will come back to Ring of Honor is, is to do a, a cage of death, stuff, which seems like a really funny like in, in storyline like no, it has to be a different kind of cage match that's just slightly different. But um, Gabe then jumps on the mic and he says, "I can't believe Ring of Honor is doing a cage of death match." It's he's, it's the only show of the year CZW draws anybody, which I thought like Teddy. again, it's one of those things. Yeah, it's like in CZW, like when they've been helping you draw, like the, eh, I don't know, man. But I yeah, get it. Do you few. think? Do you think Zandig cared that Gabe said that? Uh, I feel like in wrestling, especially in indie wrestling, like never underestimate how petty people could be. I wouldn't be surprised if that got back. I'd be a little annoyed by that. But either way, um, as soon as Hero causes the DQ, the crowd's chanting for homicide, so they know what's coming. Um, Hero grabs the mic as fans throw garbage in the ring. That's the other interesting thing. And I wonder if going to like Meltzer's theory, we'll, we'll see this during the, the next match. And, you know, I did notice more garbage throwing on this show. Yeah, I did too. You know, I think this is a this was a particularly rowdy crowd on this night for one thing. Yeah, but yeah, I I I'm just, I'm I mean I know probably in like people who love old school wrestling might appreciate the throwing stuff. It's never I'm never a fan of it. Like I, yeah. I don't want to watch a bunch of garbage in the ring. Like that's just not my thing. But I do wonder if just like the, this show being so crazy thus far made me kind of embolden someone to think, you know, going to day series that once you see someone kind of does something, you know, people are – we're all sheep, Matt. We're herd animals. We, we, we're we easily influenced by what a – when that one bad apple does something, we all start thinking, hey, I could throw my gum wrapper at Chris Hero like during this match. It, it's OK. But you know, anyway – um. Hero gets on the mic. He says he's the man with no fear, and he and Claudio stomp as he and Claudio stomp on Adam Pierce. Hero says all the chaos he's caused in Ring of Honor is just the beginning. He has no fear because he's on Homicide's turf of New York, and he still took his boy Julius Smokes out. He has supreme confidence that Homicide isn't going to do a damn thing. Hero says he'll cause havoc July 15th at Cage of Death in Philadelphia, at which point the lights go out. Homicide's music hits. Out he comes to the ring. He attacks Hero. He attacks Claudio. He tosses Hero CZW title down. Um, Homicide and Pierce accidentally knock into each other. They have like a stare down, a little bit of tension before Homicide just does his tope con Hilo onto Hero. So, you know, they're key. I like that. So they're keeping that tension going, which will pay off in a few shows down the road. Um, Pierce chases Claudio out of the wrestling area, maybe out of the building even. And Homicide tells the ref to ring the bell. We got our match. Semi main event, Homicide defeats Chris Hero via pinfall in 23 minutes, nine seconds after he hit a lariat. I thought this match, this was a match where the atmosphere really makes it. It's in a different setting. This is a good, very good match, maybe. I thought this was like, I would give this, I might be high on this, a flat four stars. I thought this was really fun. And I think it's because of the atmosphere. It's got a really great face heel dynamic, but it's it's also got a bit more of a laid back pace. It stretches on for a while, but yet because those stretches let you just appreciate the fan reaction, like the, the, the atmosphere, I didn't mind that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great atmosphere because it's the ultimate hometown crowd for homicide. Whenever he's in New York or New Jersey, he always gets a extra good reaction and the crowd hates hero. Like they hate basically no one else on the show. Throughout the match, people are throwing garbage at hero. They're jeering him. You can hear like he'll come out with some, a couple pretty funny, like, shit talks of hero like they're just all over him in the way only new yorkers can be matt your your people did you proud here um when hero when homicide kicks down near falls it's a big reaction because you feel like they really want to see this guy beat up this little shit hero but that's only half the fun because on the other end of this match that i thought this was just an a plus character performance for chris hero i thought you watch him i'm a fan of people that 
they're, they do like what people call, you know, like the music between the notes. They're doing little things between the moves. They're improving. Hero is just full of that here. He's always doing something. He's always reacting in ways that are appropriate and entertaining. He's always doing stuff in the moment. Like early on when Homicide just lays waste to him at ringside, he's doing the perfect level of over-the-top selling. He's doing the cowardly shitbag heel. At one point, he's crawling under the ring to try and get Homicide and I mean get away from Homicide. And Homicide drags him back out. And because whenever people do the Jimmy Rave toilet throw entrance, the, the ring crew puts all the toilet paper under the ring. As Homicide drags Hero back from under the ring, Ring. like Hero's desperately grabbing onto a bunch of toilet paper and then he just like throws like futilely throws a little bit of toilet paper at Homicide like that's going to stop Homicide and I just it's such a goofy but like the perfect kind of goofy like you're just a you're just a pathetic heel I love that and one of the reasons why this match it feels slower is because it's like almost like they're luxuriating like in the crowd atmosphere like they're really enjoying it Hero's really playing with it and um Hero's also really good at just about filling the gaps with little in the moment things. Like even when he does something as simple as a chin lock, which often can be like people like out and go, that's boring. He's doing cross faces and ear claps. And it's like a 10 to 15 second chin lock, but he's still doing stuff even within that to try and just keep it fresh. I, I just really, I thought Hero was just fantastic in this match as a performer. And when the crowd chants for like at one point, Homicide does the STF and we must've been in the era of the STF FU at this point, because when Homicide does it, even though that's a move, Homicide would pull out semi-regularly and, you know, the crowd chants, you know, fuck John Cena Hero, when of course, when he gets control, will then do, does the, you can't see me hand gesture again, just lean into things, you know, playing with the crowd. Um, yeah, it, it, Matt, this match, like, there's good action to it, too, but as, as far as that, it's nothing special in the action. It's good. It's not special, but it's just uh, – I miss – I feel like this is one direction indie wrestling was it going in, and we've gone in the in another direction. And I still like some – like, I like the last five, seven years, whatever, PWG, but I feel like so often now, a lot of the big super indies, it's just wrestling for wrestling's sake, and to – we you know – Ring of Honor had matches like this where it was like just as much of the fun of the match was the heel face dynamic and the character work as what these two guys were doing. And I I feel like we've gotten so much less of that now, and I really miss that. Uh, I think there's a, a decent bit of daylight between you and me on this one. I um, I liked it less than you. Um, I uh, I think I would agree with you that the the just reveling in the crowd heat – would work for me if this match was 10 minutes shorter. But because it was 20 minutes and they milked it so much, I kind of felt like if it wasn't for the crowd, this would have been just like a flat out boring match in a lot of ways. Wow. Um, I So I, this is probably controversial to say because I, I love Chris Hero and this version of him was a great character, but I think this might be my least favorite version of Chris Hero when it comes to match quality. You know, like he he had some really you know matches that I loved a lot as a babyface in IWA Mid South. You know that that the later more hard hitting version of Chris Hero I thought just had some awesome matches. This version where he's just like he works the crowd, you know he does it very well. The crowd reacts, but I just don't find the matches very exciting all the time. Um, at least in ROH, you know maybe in other promotions, you know he he does a little bit. Like I just I don't I remember seeing a an a shoot interview with with Gabe Sapolsky where he talked about how one of the most frustrating things for him was seeing after he left how Hero became this like hard hitting ass kicker and whereas while he was there Hero really leaned into like the kind of goofier aspects of his personality and you know I I think maybe I appreciated the goofier aspects a little more than Gabe did but I kind of see where he's coming from you know this is a a promotion that's built on great matches and Hero decided you know, again, in an effective way that I'm going to be something different. I'm going to be a heel and I'm going to stooge and I'm going to be entertaining in other ways. And that's how I'm going to get over. And he got over, but it just, the match, the matches have not really done that much for me, um, during this era. And I feel like this match was another one of those. Like just, it just didn't do that much for me. I, I, they're good wrestlers, so it was good. You know, there were entertaining things with the crowd, like the fact that the crowd started chanting just kill at one point. I don't know if you yeah. noticed that. They were just like, kill, kill, kill. Again, the crowd is here for this match is fantastic. You know? Yeah, but I mean, this is, I mean, this building, like, it's just that, that's how it is. Cause I remember, you know, I, I kind of, um, analogize it to the, um, homicide Jay Lethal match in that building almost a year before this. 
And it's very similar. Like, the, the, the crowd really made that match. But that match, I think, didn't linger as long. I think it, I think this match just, to me, overstayed its welcome just a little bit. Um, maybe even more than a little bit, honestly. Um, but, like, as far as other things go, like, you know, you're totally right that this is a different kind of crowd. It's a New York crowd. They love homicide. But it is funny to hear Prezak talking about the New York crowd when they're brawling around the front row because, like, all the people in the front row are just the same people that you see in the front row at every show, no matter where they are. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just true. Like, I mean, there are a few people that are different, but, like, for the most part, you see all the familiar faces. So it's like, oh, this New York crowd. It's like it's it's all the same people. They had some great lines. Like, one line I, – I wrote a couple down. There's one line where Heroes in Control and a fan screams, you're going to – you." you when Heroes in Control, he goes, you're still going to die right here, he says. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and, and then there's another one. This is my favorite one where here at one point, there, a table comes to play late in the match. Hero sits up in the corner and eventually, you know, someone goes through it. Spoiler. And uh, so here's looking for a table under the ring. And you can hear a fan go, hope you're looking for talent. And I just thought, wow. <laughs> I was just like, I love how the fans just really got on him. And you could really hear it. You know, like they were just having fun just shitting on him at every turn. It's like a New York comedy club. Um, especially in that era, but, um, but yeah, no, just, you know, a lot of cravats, a lot of eye pokes. Um, but you know, you get, you do get some, some good suplexes, um, and you know, the sea of toilet paper under the ring, like you mentioned, um, there was even a kill the ref chant after, uh, hero, uh, kicks out of something and he's going to grab his, uh, his CZW belt. Which belt did he have at this point? I think remember? it was the CZW title because he had yeah. just won that like recently. And uh, again, also the belt plays – gets a nice near fall here. It goes full circle where Heroes at the start of the show knocks out Smokes out of the show with a belt shot here. Later, late in the match, he hits Smoke – I mean hits Homicide with the belt and Homicide kicks out. So I thought that was a nice kind of full circle near fall there. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I definitely appreciated the crowd, but I just – the match was just too long and I didn't find the action – interesting enough to uh to support the length i guess is how i'd feel so i, I pretty def- pretty I good def- pretty good but i didn't love it at to say the least I think it's one of those matches where one thing in this case like the atmosphere is so i like so much that almost kind of just overwhelms how i feel about anything else it's almost like ruins my objectivity not that you i, I mean it's my personal feelings but sometimes with a match you can get like that where i, where I like something about so much i'm kind of like you know what? That just justifies this match's existence all on its own. But I can definitely see why people would be more like you. Your, your thoughts. Um, Although I'm sure my thoughts on Chris Hero are probably not well, um, not well supported by the audience. He was at large. a pretty divisive figure. I mean, I mean, I mean, he's, I remember, I mean, he's obviously one of the great. I mean, he's one of the great wrestlers of his era, and like, like he could have done a totally different style and been great at it, and he did in different points. But just this particular version of him getting over so over as a heel. I just didn't find that this was the part, the point of his career where he had the most great singles matches, I guess is what I would I, say. I famously remember there was a period where um, Figure Four, day, uh, the Brian and Vinny show on Figure Four, Brian Alvarez and Vince, um, they reviewed Ring of Honor DVDs for a period from like the, maybe, I forget, it was 2000, it might have been 2007 era or, it might, or something like that. And Brian Alvarez famously like did not get Chris Hero. Like he was way more negative than you feeling bad were. Like, 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 and people would people would get on the forums. Like I think I might have the people getting on him. Like you don't get it. Like he's kind of parroting like flippy do guys and stuff when he's doing all these crazy kip ups. Just but like he was like he the, the, he was not alone. There were people that were like I don't get this guy. So and until the, then I think once he got did the knockout kid stuff like you were mentioning earlier, then I feel like he won over a lot of people even that were never on board with him. Apparently, but, even Gabe Sapolsky, who was yeah, gone exactly. by then. Yeah. I mean, like, 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 that's the other thing. Like, you, like, you worry about being hard on Chris Hero. There was no one that was probably harder on Chris Hero in some ways than the guy that, like, kept him out of the super indie Ring of Honor for a bunch of years until a one-off, and then it just took off so well that, like, but the he fun- couldn't deny him. But the funny part is, like, the version of Chris Hero that Gabe was rejecting was having matches that I still consider really amazing in other indies. You know, like, where he was a little bit more serious. When he really, really, like, leaned into the, the parody stuff... I still, I still really liked watching him. I just didn't find that the the matches were as good as in other eras. That, that's 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 my main yeah. thing. You were getting your joy. You would get your joy from a different. Like, yeah, like that gimmick. The gimmick he's kind of in now and will keep refining. It's not conducive to him having the best possible matches Chris Hero can have. But in some ways, I could see the argument. It's also maybe his most entertaining character. 
the kind of guy who's really just shit stirring Ring of Honor and almost like mocking them in how he works. But um, after the match, Homicide instructs the Ring of Honor students to take this piece of shit out of the building. They carry Chris Hero away as the fans chant NYC. Uh, Hero ends up fighting off the students though, so they don't get him out of the building like like a Super Dragon style. And he flees to the crowd as Homicide tells him, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, run, little bitch." Homicide with the mic. He sits in the chair in the middle of the ring. He tells us, the fans, that he's been in this company since day one. He's the OG of Ring of Homicide. For years, he's been fucked over. He's lost friends. He's got people trying to job him. I think he said he got screwed over. He, I think he said, he, I've got people trying to job me. I think that's what he said. He said, I've been screwed over by the politics of the wrestling business. Homicide says in 2006, he's the MVP. 2006 is his destiny, and he isn't talking about the last show, which, of course, was called Destiny. I thought that was a cute moment they had to clear that up. By the end of this year, he will become world champion. He calls out Ring of Honor employees. He calls out Sid by name, who was a Ring of Honor employee. He calls out Kerry Silken, the owner. He calls out Gabe, and he says, if I don't get a title shot, I'm going to quit, and I'll go to a play. If he doesn't get a title shot by the end of the year, he'll quit, and he'll go to a better place for more money. And so... Yeah, this was the uh, the start of the huge Homicide Becomes Champ angle. Uh, going to the Observer, Dave wrote, Homicide delivered the cop killer for the pin, which, by the way, Dave, no, he didn't. Dave kind of – Dave said he got so many reports of the Adam Pierce thing. Apparently, no one got some of these details right because he, Homicide does not hit the cop killer in this match, let alone win with it. Anyway, Dave continues, and Homicide then did the Jerry Lawler in 1985 gimmick saying that if he didn't win the world title by the end of this year – he was quitting Ring of Honor. The idea is a long build towards a December match in New York with Homicide challenging for the title. And this is another thing that I miss, you know, from that we kind of lost in some of the indies for a long time. And to this day, it's not as prevalent, which is how many big indies like super card indies set up an angle that's six months in the offing. Like, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, listen, I don't. I don't watch. G- I don't watch GCW, GCW like super closely, and I know they do do. You know, longer term storyline. So they I do get, some stuff, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, almost almost none. And like the fact that you can be like, okay, we're going to set this up, and like we feel pretty confident that we'll we'll be able to see it through. You know, like I think that's one thing that makes it harder now. You know, yeah, that's the other thing. A lot of indies couldn't do this even if they want to because it's like if this guy has any steam, he might not be here in six months. And it, it kind of shows you like the landscape of wrestling back then, how some really great talents did not get fully appreciated, where you could just kind of confidently say yeah yeah homicide will be here in six months um that brings us to the non-title three-way match so this was not for brian danielson's ring of honor world title uh, your main event and it's a good thing it wasn't for the title because brian danielson loses this match kenta defeats brian danielson and samoa joe in 20 minutes 23 seconds when he pinned danielson after he hit us a, a go to sleep um matt you're gonna go first on this but first i think we should kind of go over just from the observer what happened in this match because this kind of colors the entire match. So to the observer, Dave Meltzer would write reports on the main event range from three and a half stars to four and a quarter stars. The idea was to build three different future singles matches out of this with Kenta losing the GHC junior title. The politics aren't as strong to where he couldn't do jobs here in ring of honor. At least one would think the negative on the match. If there was one is that all three guys were knocked silly at different points because the bout was so stiff. Joe dropped Kenta on his head, and he pretty much forgot everything from there. He stayed down for a while and was still glassy-eyed when he got back up, although he was fine for the finish, which, Dave, you know, I'm going to – I'm sure you could dispute Dave on that too. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Kenta hit Joe in the left ear, and Joe at first thought his right eardrum was busted. His ear was ringing, but an hour after the match, it went away. Danielson was also knocked silly at one point, and he and Kenta were off on some stuff. So, Matt, this is literally on a night of crazy things happening where things went wrong. This is the cherry on top – a three-way match where literally all three guys got like serious head injuries. What this is the match you were looking forward to, this everyone was looking forward to. What'd you think about it? Whew. Well, okay, so this match, gosh, what do you say about it? It was all at once disappointing. I'm gonna start with that. But based on my like incredible expectations, because this was a dream match. Um but in addition to that, it was also super compelling incredibly hard hitting had an incredible atmosphere and was kind of awesome <laughs> like all that all at the same time i feel like for unusual reasons and maybe some just normal ones i feel like this is kind of a must see match um and i think in some ways the story of the match was samoa joe 
Um, cause Joe came in. I don't know if you like perceived this the same way I did. We talked about Joe maybe like not being full Joe in ROH over the past few months. Joe came in like so hot here. Like he this was, was Joe versus Kobashi Joe. Yeah. And like, like, but like, so hot to the point where it's like, geez, like almost like settle down a little bit, man. Like <laughs> between how hard he was hitting people, um, just like knocking people, like dropping people on his head. And then there was a spot. This is the spot I was talking about. So there's a moment where like they're on the outside and Joe is dragging Kenta around the ringside. And he's going to throw Kenta into the front row to, so Daniel Sink could do his dive onto them. And he goes to where Green Lantern fan is sitting. Green Lantern fan is just sitting there. But Joe screams in his face like, like I, I God, I, if I was Green Lantern fan, I would have absolutely shit myself. He screams <laughs> in his face, pulls him to the side, and then you hear Prezak on commentary, and he's like, "Yeah, if you see someone coming your way, move." And I was just like, "Why would he see him coming their way? He was just sitting there." And like Joe, it's not like Joe like asked to play. Joe was just like, Rawr! and like, and I rewound it a few times. Be like, what did he say to him? But like I couldn't tell. But he just he screamed at him, and, and didn't feel to like Joe went out of his way to carry Kenta just a Green Lantern fan. Like he yeah. was pulling for, and he stopped. It's like he went out of his way to like, no, I'm going to move you right so I can tell Green Lantern. Like if I, you have to go in the crowd, you're going right, right over fucking GLF, you know? Yeah, and like I don't know. It's like between that and the spit, like did Green Lantern fan really piss somebody off that weekend? And like everyone was like just like getting their receipts on him? I don't know. But I, I have no just, idea. But I can tell you this. You could see Green Lantern fan kind of standing there out of the way while they were setting up the Danielson springboard spot. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but he, that guy seemed fucking terrified. Um, <laughs> and I would be... When Lacey spits on you, it's all fun and games. When Joe screams at you, it's different. I would be absolutely terrified because like this guy's just sitting there watching the show and just like he gets screamed at by fucking Samoa Joe. Like, oh my god. Um, so I think that Joe is like, like, like the the in, I guess the star of the match in some ways, but like he's the catalyst of a lot of what's the vibe of this match. Because I think actually Kenta's performance is pretty awesome here, um, despite being knocked out very early. So I guess I can run through some of the big spots. Um, you start out with, um, first of all, Danielson you know, has Bobby Cruz announce him as being from the best city in the world, Aberdeen, Washington, which I thought was a great line in for New York. Um, as someone who lives in the Pacific Northwest, I feel like most people in this area would not even agree with that. Like, right. even, I, I, I mean, the building, I mean, Dan, like, Danielson obviously doesn't agree with it. He's saying it because <laughs> New Yorkers call themselves the best city in the world. So it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I just love, there's something, if you, if you know this area, it's like, that's extra funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you start out with like, Joe won't shake Kenneth's hand. He gives him the middle finger, but he does shake, uh, Danielson's, but then Kenta won't shake Danielson's hair. He gives him the ha- hand. <laughs> she doesn't shake his hair either. Um, shakes his <laughs> hand, gives, gives him the middle finger. They're really building up a strong issue between Joe and Kenta, but you know, obviously this was the only payoff. Like this, it doesn't go anywhere after this. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, no, I don't think they have any other matches together after this. Um, at least not, funny, at least, at least not in America. In, it's funny because, again, Dave writes in The Observer, the idea behind this was to set up three matches. Well, I assume that means one of the matches they were going to set up was Kenta Joe, but yeah, I mean, they it's pretty obvious never they were do it. it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they but yeah, never do it. So Danielson starts by, you know, hitting both guys, kicking away, raking eyes. And so then Kenta and Joe team up to kick the crap out of Danielson. Then they kick the crap out of each other. And, you know, when I say kick the crap, like they're, all the kicks here are super hard. Um, Joe at one point, I mean, at the, this is the spot pretty very early in the match, like the very, very beginning of the match. Um, Kenta leaps on Joe's shoulder and Joe just like drops him on his head. And I know that Dave said that's where Kenta got hurt, but... It's also totally possible that he got hurt seconds later because he gets up and then Joe just slaps him in the face and he just comes goes out like a light to the point where the crowd starts chanting, Joe killed Kenta, which I don't know. I feel like I hope that a crowd nowadays would not start chanting that if they think someone is really hurt because Kenta is just like in a heat for a couple minutes. As, uh, Do you also think that was the spot where Joe apparently thought he got his eardrum busted? Because they show they show a rare for Rainbow instant replay of both the drop, but also right before that, Kenta slaps Joe yeah. and catches him right in this. And I think that's probably the slap where so basically yeah. in like a ten second sequence, like Joe gets rocked, 
Joe drops Kent on his head. Yeah, so I'm sure like it's all of that's related. You know, like Joe's out of sorts. Yeah. He's probably his equilibrium is fucked up. He's like just like what the fuck's going on? Drops Kent on his head, smacks him in the face. Like everything is just like it's just like a train wreck, but like completely compelling. Um, and another thing that happens that's go- that goes wrong here, which I don't think Dave reported, and I don't think you. They don't. You can't see it on the DVD because they cleverly edit in a uh, an instant replay so we don't show it. But the lights go out. Um, wow. Yeah, the lights went out like very early, like right after all this stuff was happening, and so they show a replay to um to actually I think it might be at, it might be but after the drop on the head but before the slap maybe uh, I'm I'm not sure exactly. Um, Could you imagine if you're Kenta and Joe, especially Kenta, and you're like. Maybe just completely screwed up, and then the lights in the building go. Out. Yeah, like yeah. Of all the times for them to go out. Yeah, that's something that I vividly remember, and like, yeah, that's why they. That's why you have those like uncharacteristic slow motion replays thrown into the middle of the match. You know, you know, you really don't see that too often in ROH unless oh, there's something to cover the to edit. Cover. Yeah, I never realized that. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's why they do it. Um, but yes, but, but Kenta gets back up. You know, he gathers his bearings enough and he like, you know, he hits a springboard double drop kick on Joe and Danielson. He gets suplexed a bunch of times. Joe continues with the strikes, flurry of slaps, leaping into Gary on Danielson. Um, Danielson gets both guys in opposite corners, hits them both with forearms and then poses in the middle while they each slump in their corners. Kenta comes back with kicks, but Joe takes him down. And then Danielson charges at Joe, but Joe catches him and slams him down on top of Kenta. And like between the language and the probable concussion, Kenta's got it's got to be hard to plan those spots with Kenta, you know? Like, oh, I'm gonna throw a big guy down on top of you. Um, yeah. But you know, they did it. They, they it seems like they did all the spots they had planned. Um, uh, Joe does a really good elbow suicida onto both Danielson. And uh, and Kenta, you know, for all I'm saying about Joe coming in too hot, it also means that his offense just looks extra intense, and it, you know, I, I think that that it, it enhances things in some ways. But the uh, this is when we get the scream at Green Lantern fan, like, and it is a scream, man. Like, I, I'm just like, what? Like, I was like traumatized by it. I'm like, my God. But um, so Danielson does his springboard dive onto both of them. Um, and then back in the ring, Kenta and Danielson go for missile drop kicks on Joe, but Joe moves and they basically both crash into each other, which is another spot that could have gone horribly wrong because they both land on each other's legs. Um, and then Kenta hits a flying knee onto Joe in the corner and Danielson takes that as an opportunity to put Joe on the top rope to go for a superplex. Uh, Joe knocks him off and Kenta leaps up, does the top rope falcon arrow on Joe, which Kind of incredible to do that on Joe, especially yeah. in his in, in Kenneth's condition. Danielson breaking up the pin. I thought that might have been the best spot of the whole match with um with uh, Joe knocking off Danielson, Kenta leaping up, hitting the Falcon Arrow, getting the the two count. Danielson breaking up the pin. I thought that whole sequence was phenomenal. Um, so then uh, Danielson gets a Dragon Suplex on Joe, but Kenta leaps it at them. So Danielson drops Joe. Or actually, he doesn't get the dragon suplex on Joe. He goes for it. He puts in the full Nelson. But Dan, but Kenna leaps at them. So Danielson drops Joe, catches Kenna's arm, does the cattle mutilation, which Joe breaks up pretty much immediately with a senton. And then Joe goes for a muscle buster on Kenta, and Danielson clips his leg. Because remember, Joe has the hurt leg, and he attack- and Danielson attacked it on the show before. So Joe is out for a little while, at her- selling the leg. And so now we get a sequence with Danielson and Kenta. Um at one point, this is like one of the few times you could really see the effects of Kenta's uh, head injury because Danielson goes for a roaring elbow, but Kenta doesn't duck in time, so he sort of gets hit when he's not supposed to. So you could see Danielson like talking to him, and they do the spot again, and this time Kenta ducks um, and kicks Danielson. Um, get a few more spots, um, and you could see that Danielson has to keep talking to Kenta a lot, so Kenta is definitely like getting more loopy at this point. Um, but he goes for his like his combo of strikes. Danielson stops with an elbow for two. Uh, he gets a regal plex on Kenta for two. Uh, hits the belly to back superplex on Kenta. Gets another two count. And then he goes for a cross face chicken wing. But that's when Joe comes back in, hits an enzigiri on Danielson, um, and he he elbows Joe back out of the ring, and then gets gets the chicken wing again on Kenta. But Kenta fights it off. Hits a tiger suplex. Gets a two count off of that. 
And then Joe limps back in, but kind of gets him with a Texas clover leaf. And Joe teases tapping, but Danielson breaks it up with a drop kick to Kenta and then locks in a cattle mutilation on Kenta, turns it into a pinning combo, gets a two count on that. Uh, Kenta comes back in, goes for the go to sleep, but Danielson gets out by raking Kenta's eyes. So then Joe picks up Danielson and he drops Danielson on Kenta's knee for an assisted go to sleep. And pretty sure that's when Danielson gets knocked out. Um, Ken hits the Busaiku knee on Joe, which sends him out of the ring, and then hits another go to sleep on Danielson and gets the win. Um, so you could tell, like, there was a ton of action there. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was really good action. Like, honestly, like, incredible action in some circumstances. Um, but man, was it brutal. And it was messy. And so it didn't quite reach the heights that, you know, I was hoping for going in. But watching it back all these years later, it's like the disappointment that I felt was far lessened. And the more the feeling that I felt more watching it back was like, oh my God, this is fucking insane. It's super compelling, super watchable, horrifying in some ways, but just these two, these three guys were so great. And I just think this match was wild. It was chaos. And I think you have to watch it. (laughs) Yeah. I, I think that sums it up better than I ever could. I, I, although I will still try to add my own thoughts, but yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's disappointing and yet incredibly compelling. Like that with, it's rare you can call a match those three things. And and I would agree it's worth watching. I I thought this was a hard match for me to rewatch because knowing, knowing just that, not just that all three going in that every gun was screwed up during the match, but also knowing Joe and Danielson have had, some pretty notable struggles with concussions. And then they're not the ones that are the most affected in this match. And that was, you know, it, it's, and the other thing I would say to really stress is I think anyone that's watched a lot of wrestling, and especially if you watched a bunch of wrestling and combat sports, you know, mixed martial arts and boxing, you've seen guys get rocked, so to speak. Like they take a big head blow. They probably, it's probably something that will be a concussion, you know, something that hurts the brain, but they will be like, compromised for 30 seconds to a minute, but then they will kind of snap out of it. And that doesn't mean they don't have a concussion. doesn't mean, you know, that's not serious, but there's just something where they're very compromised and then they snap out of it. And that's not kind of like this, or this is a guy, you know, that's one of the, him getting drunk in the, I said, is one of the first spots in the match. Like it's in the first minute or two, I think. And he, I think is noticeably hurt. The entire 20 minutes like he, he he's it, it's not that he's not doing other than that Danielson sequence. It's not that he's not doing his moves well, like you're right when he's executing moves. They look really good and he's doing some cool moves. It's that right from that moment, he's immediately laying down for a long time. And you can see Joe and Danielson, you know, having to wrestle probably alone longer than they thought. And then it feels like the entire rest of the match. It's almost to me like Danielson and Joe are wrestling. And then every once in a while they realize okay, Kenta's been out of this match for too long, and he probably doesn't remember the spot, so he's just going to lay there until we do something, and they will get him involved. They'll probably tell him a couple spots to do, and then as soon as Kenta has the excuse to lay down again, he's just going to lay down again because he's probably in a very bad way. And it's painful to watch that because it's painful to watch a guy. I haven't seen a ton of matches where a guy gets like a serious concussion in the first couple minutes doesn't snap out of it and just guts through it for 20 minutes and it, it is and and that sequence you mentioned late in the match it's probably in the final five minutes of a 20 minute match where Danielson looks like he's throwing for a roaring elbow and it it, it look it must have been an elbow that Kenta was supposed to duck because he's Danielson's throwing it kind of weird and oddly high but Kenta doesn't duck it so it looks really or counter it. He doesn't do either. So it looks really bad. And then you see something you rarely see, which is Brian Danielson immediately talks to Kenta and repeats the same spot, which in some ways is kind of like an amateur move, but like, and then at that point, Kenta ducks it and he responds with some high kicks that miss Brian by like a mile and he still sells it. It's like one of the most ugly sequences you will ever see from Kenta or Brian Danielson. And that must be, you know, again, this is probably like 15 minutes after the concussion. That shows you just how bad a way Kenta was in. And for, so watching all that, that made me feel really, you know, I, I'm a guy that I usually, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. Like, oh, someone gets hurt, but that's part of life. That's part of wrestling. I just kind of push back that in my cold, 
black heart, Matt. But this kind of affected me to some degree rewatching this thing. Just I forgot just how badly he was screwed up. But but, but, but when you heard him talk afterwards, like he didn't sound like he was a mess. You no, know, that's what's weird well, about it. Like Dave says he was OK by the end. Again, I don't feel confident in saying that because, again, he seemed to be in kind of the same pattern the whole match. And, he, and that ugly sequence did come in the final few minutes. But, I mean, clearly, yeah, he was good enough to talk. And w- and when it was time for him to do spots, like something like doing a top rope Falcon Arrow on Samoa Joe, which I agree with you, is like the spot of the match. You know, you probably need your wits about you to do that. He did it. You know, he perfectly – Pulled it off, you know, yeah. but but you no, can I mean, still I mean, tell. I mean, people that treated concussions. This was a year before Benoit. A year, yeah. And um, I I really like the opening part. That could have gone on longer. Where Joe and um, Kenta are kicking Danielson's ass together because I felt like if you were a longtime Ring of Honor fan, it's kind of a full circle moment because the main event of the first show, Air of Honor, begins. It's a three way uh, Danielson versus D- Christopher Daniels versus Low Key, and that match has a lot of you know danielson and key being these two badasses that are like teaming up or competing to see who can beat the crap out of daniels better and Daniels being kind of the shitbag heel and i would have liked even more of that because i thought oh this kind of neat one where like danielson's now christopher daniels you know and but, but, given, how, but given how much like joe played into how much he hated kenta it would have made a little bit less sense yeah i i agree and um the other thing i i one thing i, I was gonna wonder if you noticed was you mentioned, and it's a really great point, like right after Joe coming in so hot, really throwing bombs like too much probably, uh, right after like that – you mentioned after that Kenta spot, like he really – where he drops Kenta on the head, on his head, he lays into him still and that, you were wondering maybe either that hurt him or hurt him more. I almost wonder like did Joe – Joe probably did not realize at that moment – how badly Kenta was hurt because sure. I didn't like. There's a minute or two later, like he's uh, he was no for one or two sequences after that. He still lay into Kenta. I thought, boy, does he like hate Kenta for real? And then after that, there's a couple more sequences that come after that where it's almost like Joe's gone from being super stiff to like on some forums and stuff where he's being like noticeably lighter than Joe usually does. So I wonder if Joe maybe got the word like, oh shit. I'm like, sure. I'm sure that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and also it's possible that like Kenta got hurt on both the dropped on the head and the slap. You know, yeah. like compounded head injury. Like, I mean, it's. I mean, it's possible. I don't know. It's cr- I mean, I, I again, I know we're probably not up to the point where we're talking about this, but it's pretty crazy to th- think that like Kenta just didn't just he went you know didn't take any time off. Back to these two really big time matches a week later. Yeah, it's uh. <laughs> it's insane. Um, so yeah, but still, like, it's a very good match. I w- I would say, despite the awkwardness and just the and 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 it's incredibly compelling. Above, very, like, I agree with you. People should go out of the way to watch it once. Um, I, I think it says something that a very good match is still disappointing because you know with these three, like, the expectation was probably, oh, this is gonna be one of the best matches we've seen all year. Absolute sky high. It's not that. Um, the other thing I will say is I thought the crowd, it was like, that's one of the other things that's frustrating about this match is entertaining as it is in some ways. It's frustrating because I felt, feel like if these guys didn't get hurt, this could have been one of the best matches in Ring of Honor history because Joe, as we've said, is just going for it in a way he wasn't for every single Ring of Honor show at this point. You know, Danielson and Kenta are great. And I, more than that, the crowd, I think, was ready. You could tell from the way the crowd was reacting early on. They were ready for this to be something absolutely special. And I feel like if you listen to this crowd, they're hot for the whole match. But after that really big whiff Danielson-Kenta thing late in the match, they're a little bit lower after that. It's almost like they kind of realize that by that point, like, this isn't going to be quite the match we were hoping. Like, you know, it, it just isn't. And it doesn't mean they turn on the match or, or get quiet, but you definitely feel like, oh, they've they've dropped a little bit here. And, yeah, really just amazingly compelling. Um, on commentary, uh, MSL points out that Kenta will now be a regular in Ring of Honor. He's not just, they're considering him a regular. He's not just going to be a part-time guy, although he is kind of part-time. He's not going to be on every single show. Prezak mentions this is Kenta's first three-way match ever in wrestling. Um, the, it's really cool. Before the match even starts, there's a chance for all three guys at one point, and they're so split that it actually they all kind of blend together, which usually doesn't happen, which I really – I think that was a really cool moment. It just shows how popular all three guys were. 
And then um, there was no guys at ringside filming the match probably for Japanese TV, which part of me also wonders is that maybe that's the reason why Joe got really hot because Joe, you know, he would later on work for – and I feel like a lot of times a lot of wrestlers, they would really put on that extra level when they knew Japanese people were filming or watching because, hey, you never know. This could be extra bookings for me if I really make a good impression, and he proceeded to make an impression in, in, in a way. And the last thing I want to mention is – and you mentioned this kind of – um. They're really building Kenta Joe more than Kenta Danielson. Like we'll get to it after after the match. Like Kenta and Danielson show respect to each other. Kenta and Joe don't. And before the match, Kenta won't shake Joe's hand, and Joe flips him off. But and Kenta teases shaking Danielson, but flips him off instead. But then at, after the match happens, we'll get to it in just a second. Yeah, Kenta will shake Danielson's hand. So it, it's weird. Like it's, it's like they're built. Even though the match we get is Kenta Danielson, they're really building the idea that like. Kenta and Danielson might have a bit of a competitive rivalry, but it's Kenta and Joe that really actually hate each other. Absolutely. And, um, Joe, Joe sells that big time. He obviously wanted that match. Yeah. Um, so immediately after the match, Todd Sinclair has an extended conversation with Kenta, who's lying flat on his stomach. So Kenta, again, to my point that Joe's – I mean Dave saying Kenta was fine by the end. I mean Kenta's really laying there any chance he gets. Even when the match is done, when he just won the match, like Sinclair's talking to him. You know, probably checking, like, how how are you feeling right now? The crowd chants for Kenta. Todd Sinclair eventually helps him to his feet. Kenta grabs the mic, and he says he's home, New York City. He wants a championship match. Joe snatches the mic and tells Kenta if he wants a championship match, he needs to worry about Joe because he's taking it from Danielson. He speaks a little Japanese to Kenta, probably nothing nice, flips off Kenta. Joe walks over to Danielson and says he took a cheap shot of him during the match with the chop block. So here's my cheap shot. And he slaps Danielson hard across the face, which, again, knowing that all three of these guys got rocked, not the funnest thing to watch. He then hits him in the head with the mic pretty hard, too, before he walks to the back. Kenta helps Danielson back to his feet. The two shake hands. So Kenta and Danielson, they've earned each other's respect. We get another Kenta chant. Danielson limps to the back. Kenta gets on the mic and he tells us again and he tells us, see you next week. So another thing, really, one of the things that Gabe was great at the booking, Matt, I just want to point out, at this point, Danielson had all these challengers set up. He had um, Colt Cabana because they had the idea of, I beat Colt in five minutes. He had won a number one contendership match on a recent show. You know, we're coming back to Chicago. That match is going to come soon. They're going to wrestle another time after that. So that's a feud coming up still. Um, Danielson and Kenta now. We, we have set up because he just Kenta just pinned him. That's coming up. Danielson and Joe, they've been building up for a bunch of shows. That's coming up. Uh, Danielson and Homicide, they just started the build of that on the last show in this show. That's coming up. And Danielson and Nigel, they're still going to wrestle three more times this year. And they're, you know, N- Nigel's still keeping that hot with the promos and the idea that Nigel, like Danielson has five or six guys. Like basically most of the rest of his title rank for the next six months is already set up for him, which is kind of crazy. Gabe was a really, really, really good booker <laughs> at his peak. Like just like yeah. a – like just – I'd say a, like a top tier in terms of just like setting things up, paying them off logically, like very thoughtful, smart booker. And that's the other thing too. Like we, we you talked about earlier about how you know some of the long-term booking you can't maybe do in today's wrestling with – Indie guys getting snapped up. Everything here that I just mentioned, it's all going to get paid off. All those matches are going to happen. No one's going to leave, you know, you know, yeah. it, I, and I don't know if you could do that today. True. But like, even in like major, like promotions where guys are under contract, the, you don't have like this much care put into setting up challengers. No, exactly. And I think a lot of people, they just book by the one feud at a time and if there is multiple feuds they're kind of a mess where i think joe i mean gabe at his best like which he is here is really good at you know has all these them feuds all. but yeah. it's like yeah you don't feel like like they're all gonna get their spotlight they're all gonna get their moment yeah um so we cut to robert strong and austin aries backstage strong says they proved again that they're the best tag team in ring of honor aries corrects him says no we're the best tag team in the world the Briscoes barge in saying it's a matter of time before they get their tag titles back. Strong asks, who did they beat? So got some shade on Jason Blade and uh, Sterling Keenan. Uh, the Briscoes say they got a man up. Aries tells them to work their way, uh, you know, back up from the top to back up from the bottom to the top if they want another title shot. At that point, uh, Strong compliments Aries' necklace, and Aries says it matches his sunglasses. So we have gone full circle on the promos. 
And then at that point, because as we mentioned earlier, this show only went 243, it ran short. We get an FIP bonus match where the Fast and Furious team of J- Jarrell Clark and Jay Fury take on Chase and Rance and Seth Delay. We're not going to be covering that for a variety of reasons. Yep. So that is in your face. Uh, the, Matt, um, I, this is a weird – this is an uh, – I don't think we've covered a show quite like this. And it's do you, a show do you agree where, with me that it was a good name for this show, an apropos name, In Your Face? At first, I hated the name In Your Face, but the more I lived with it over the years, the more I was like it kind of sticks out, which yeah. is good, right? But like, I also, like, just, I also just think it fits. Like it's a stupid name, but like it. this is an In Your Face <laughs> – this is a very In Your Face kind of show. Like it's just like it slaps you in the face. It slaps the wrestlers in the face. It's – it's in your face. And also that guy says it in the crowd. Yeah, and I feel like this is a show where like I think the theme is uh, so many of the matches were not as good as they could have been as strict wrestling matches or things went wrong. And yet they were all incredibly compelling. Like I know you did not like Hero Homicide as much as me, but that's probably not the best match those two could have. But crowd atmosphere is great and you got memorable stuff that happened you know, to me. Um Davy Richards and Jimmy Rave, you know, they probably could have had a longer match. If they had a few more minutes, it probably could have been gotten to be great. But it's a compelling going short because of the crazy chandelier break. You know, the main event we just talked about, not as disappointing, not probably as close to as good as those three could have had, but incredibly compelling because of the story of it. You know, the uh, Jimmy Jacobs, BJ Winmer match, they could have a better match than that. Probably they didn't bring bust out every single thing they could do, but I don't think anyone's leaving disappointed when you see how that match ended. So I feel it's like a very special weird night where that theme just happened over and over again. And uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the atmosphere I think was electric. Uh, The night was chaos. So memorable and pour one out for ROH, at the New Yorker hotel in to me, I was at three of the four shows in that venue, and the one I wasn't at is still one of my favorite shows. That is just a, a legendary venue for Ring of Honor. Just you can't beat the atmosphere. And I looked, and I guess I can't absolutely confirm this, but I can find no evidence that there was ever another wrestling show held at the New Yorker Hotel after this of any kind. I, I again, I can't say that one hundred percent certain, certainly, but. I have found no evidence of any other wrestling shows to be held at the New Yorker Hotel after this night in June 2006. And the New Yorker is um, is still around, right? The hotel, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, I mean, I think the TikTok Diner is still there, and you know, the Hammerstein is is right next to uh, is right next to it. I'm, I'm Googling it right now because it's not like I'm ever staying there, but like, yeah, yeah, the New York Hotel is still there and it's four star rated. Because part of it feels like, you know, maybe that was too small for uh, 2006 Ring of Honor, but maybe 2023 GCW, like the atmosphere, I still think if you can fill it with 700, like, yeah, passionate GCW fans. I think you're missing out if you if you can if you can if there's an opportunity to book that I would look into that. Well, they ran, the, people, well they ran right next door last January. You might remember. And that. I know the Hammerstein has history and stuff. But I think the New Yorker, if you're running a, a little bit smaller show, I think it has its own cool atmosphere. That yeah, I, I miss that. I miss that. Yeah, I mean the thing is, I mean one thing that people knocked about the uh, the GCW show at the Hammerstein is, I guess in New York you can't do all the stuff that yeah. GCW likes to do. Um, it couldn't be a deathmatch heavy show. Absolutely, you'd have to do more of the focus more on the Nick Waynes of the world and not the G Ravers. Right, but yeah, sure. I mean, that would be a show in that building. As long as they, you know, don't way overpack it, I think. You know, I mean, we'll see. We'd let it would be a good try to see if you can get that vibe back. Maybe um the new version of Ring of Honor should just try to randomly hold a have hold a TV taping there and see how it goes. And no one that works there listens to us, so um. That's yeah. that for the show. Um, if you want to contact us, uh, through the years at gmail.com. That's T H R O H for through. Uh, Twitter at Trevor Game is my Twitter at Mayor MGF for Matt. We have threads on the Pro Wrestling Only forum and the Figure Four forum that I try and check occasionally. We got a lovely comment from a new listener on the just a few days ago on one of them. Uh, the show's on YouTube if for some reason you prefer to listen to it there. So next time on the show, we will be covering Throwdown, which is not spelled T-H-R-O-H, or is it? Yeah, actually, it is, but they don't capitalize it all fancy. But 
either way, Throwdown is a show. <laughs> that's that's my big thing. It's a show. No, it's um, it's the first half of a double shot. It's Detroit. It's B.J. Whitmer, Jimmy Jacobs, Brian Danielson for the world title, and it is Kenta one week after getting his brains turned into mashed potatoes wrestling Roderick Strong, another hard hitter. So we'll see how that goes. Should be a fun show. Matt, I can't wait. This was a great show. So until next time, have a good time. Have a great time.